on law and justice. Ms. Yates, are you there? And Ms. Yates. Maggie? Not there. Oh. Something I said. Uh, yeah, why don't you give her a call? I look up call. Uh, her computer's affected. Yeah. yeah she might be having challenges. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shall we? Uh, yeah. No, it can't be the air because the air is actually not bad. I just called Maggie. She's logging in right now. Okay. Sounds like her. Yeah. Jake, are you there? Yeah. Oh, Maggie? Yeah. She may not physically be here. She may oh, be home. I think she's working from home. We understand that Maggie Yates is uh, died again. We would go ahead and move on with the agenda, but everybody here is enjoying this wonderful dessert that uh, Gina made for That's us and stuff. Good. So we're busy eating. Wished you were here. Um, <laughs> actually not, because then we'd have to share with you. <laughs> I did set um, Maggie and the link and she should be jumping on. Okay. Good morning. My apologies for getting the time confused. No problem. Floor is yours. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so thanks for having me this morning. I'm just here to provide an update on our renewal application to the MacArthur Foundation for their Safety and Justice Challenge. As you all know, this is the grant that has awarded us funding since about 2014. Um, and you can see the priorities on the left side of the screen. Uh, and the grant is really awarded to jurisdictions across the, the country. Sorry, Oops. Pulling up your new uh, point. Oh, no problem. Thanks, Ron. So the, the priorities of the foundation are to ensure the proper use of the jail, making sure that folks who are better served in the community are released to the community and there's space for folks who need to be held in jail. Uh, making sure that we're increasing community engagement and then also addressing racial disparities. So our last award was about $1.9 million. And as you'll see on the screen in just a moment, our award for the coming two year grant cycle is capped at about $1.1 million. And that is uh, really to encourage us to uh, plan for sustainability in the coming uh, years. So you can go ahead, Ron, and move to the next slide. Um, 
this morning I'm going to be sharing again the, the proposed strategies that we have drafted into our grant for the renewal application. These strategies have been put together after weeks and weeks of meeting with the MacArthur core team. And you can see the membership of the core team, which really ser serves as the steering committee for this grant on the left side of the screen. Uh, we have consulted data wherever possible to inform what strategies have been effective and what we should include moving forward. We've consulted research as well, and then we've also conducted a lot of community outreach to make sure that we are responsive to their needs uh, and gathering relevant input from them. So you can see we've held two different community meetings presented to the Racial Equity Committee of the SRLJC and then also consulted with an advisory board that helps provide uh, uh, insight for our office. All right. So you can move to the next slide, Ron, and the next one after that. These are our current strategies that are funded by the grant. It's not an exhaustive list, but it does show what the ongoing costs would be. Uh, so you heard from pretrial services last week about their request for about $330,000 moving forward. They actually receive about $800,000 of our grant currently. Uh, and so they're just asking for about another $300,000 from the county commissioners to continue the operations that have been previously grant funded. Uh, the pretrial risk assessment tool, that's a one-time validation cost. If we continue to use it, it is best practice to get that validated. And then we've also conducted implicit bias trainings and have funding for community engagement in the current grant. You see highlighted in green are data strategies, and these are highlighted because we have written them into the grant moving forward. Uh, so you'll see these in the proposed strategies. You can go ahead, Ron. So the next uh, section just goes over what we're proposing and what we're seeking your uh, sort of approval of or input for refinement on before we submit the grant on uh, Friday, which is September 25th. So this first proposal is supported release and you are all familiar with this program. We based it off of the New York model where individuals are released pretrial to voluntary case management services instead of uh, having bail set. This would be designed for district court specifically. Municipal court already has funding um, to develop a similar model. Uh, so you can see this is really trying to address the persistent pretrial population that hovers around 70% in our jail. And we're requesting about $235,000 over the two-year grant. The next proposal is a pre-filing diversion program that would be developed in partnership with the county uh, prosecutor's office and pretrial services. The concept is to uh, create some programming that would include an uh, educational component and some cognitive behavioral therapy elements that um, if completed by an eligible person would mean that their charges would never be filed. Uh, so the county prosecutor's office right now is uh, suggesting some low level drug charges to be eligible for this. And we're continuing to refine sort of their eligible cr eligibility criteria. The cost of this program would be about $180,000 over the course of two years. And this would cover the cost for a licensed social worker who would conduct the outreach case management and the programming for uh, the pre-filing diversion program. We also are uh, writing to, or we're including court date reminders in the upcoming grant. Uh, so this includes UpTrust, which is the text messaging application based in the County Public Defender's Office. It provides court date reminders to their clients and also allows for two-way text messaging between the clients and their assigned attorney. And then it also includes continued funding for the Criminal Justice Information Hotline. The hotline fields incoming calls about any court related questions and they also make outgoing court date reminders on behalf of district court. This, however, is the one strategy that we may uh, eliminate from the final proposal based on the data that we have been able to review thus far. So we're continuing to pull the data, basically looking at how the hotline has or hasn't impacted the appearance rate in district court. And if we find that it's not having a significant impact and there's no way to uh, sort of reshape that program to have a greater impact, then um, we're considering eliminating it just because we want to be as data driven as possible. 
If we include both Uptrust and the hotline, however, it would be about $191,000 request for two years of operation. We are including uh, a new project in the upcoming application, which would be to develop a partnership with a rideshare company to provide free rides to any court related appointment for folks who are court involved. This is based on the, a successful model in Hennepin County, Minnesota, where Lyft basically rides people or drives people, excuse me, to and from court uh, and court related appointments. So we are, are proposing uh, a similar model locally. And you can go ahead round to the next slide. Uh, we're also proposing creating a technology fund that would pay for cell phones for court involved people uh, who cannot afford cell phones. The cell phones would come pre-programmed with relevant contact numbers and applications like the rideshare application, for instance, uh, for the individuals who received them. And this, of course, is to just help folks um, access whatever services are needed to stabilize in the community and continue to stay um, connected to their public defenders and the court system. We are, are also including a new initiative, which is the microgrant initiative. Uh, this would be uh, really through the work of a selection committee that would include systems actors and community members who would identify a particular challenge, uh, draft a sort of accessible and exciting RFP, and then make the selection of the winning proposal. Uh, and we would pass through up to $75,000 to a community-based organization to uh, execute or implement that vision. As you heard me say before, we are including a continuation of our data strategies in this grant proposal. So this includes the two-year cost of our data analyst, as well as the licenses and servers that she requires to not only produce analytics, but uh, maintain and expand the data dashboard. And you all have seen the, the most, the first version of the dashboard that was published. Moving forward, we're hoping to include uh, expanded reporting for courts and other uh, agencies. We are also including funding to contract with a financial analyst in the second year of the grant so that we can um, have the expertise needed to really develop cost benefit models of the various strategies. So we can see not just how is this impacting our jail population or racial disparities and community engagement, but what are the, the savings that result from these initiatives? And I think that'll be incredibly helpful for the board as you're tasked with sort of reviewing our progress and determining what investments make sense moving forward once the grant funds are no longer available. And then the final initiative that we're including is the development of an equity toolkit. This would be similar to the policy partners tool that the Spokane Regional Health District uses, uh, but it would be specific for the criminal justice system. And really it would be a series of uh, prompts or questions to help policymakers um, account for equity, including but not limited to race, gender, or socioeconomic status when we're developing and implementing a new project. Uh, this would be developed by systems actors in consultation with the Racial Equity Committee and other experts, and we're budgeting about $3,000 to develop this tool. The next slide should just show you, oh, and then other grant expenses, of course, which are right about $90,000. Um, and I should mention that Carrie uh, is reviewing our budget and assisting with the budget narrative to make sure we're um, accounting for all of our expenses uh, as well. So. I will uh, finalize this in partnership with her. And the last slide should just be uh, a quick snapshot of the various initiatives and costs. Happy to answer any questions about the, the strategies or the estimated budgets that we've included here uh, or gather any feedback from the board to incorporate in our final draft. Um, we don't have a final narrative yet, but I'm happy to circulate the, the narrative as it's currently drafted to the board for your review. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Any uh, questions for Maggie? Josh or Mary? No, I'm good, thank you. Ma Maggie, was the supported release one, did, did, did I see correctly, did it say that was only for misdemeanors? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next step is the narrative, and you'll have that done by Friday, obviously, because that's the due date. 
So, yeah. uh, and you will be distributing that to the board then? Uh, I can uh, distribute the current draft to the board this morning and then I'll, um, with your approval, once we, if with your approval, we'll submit the grant and then uh, once it's submitted, I'll circulate the final draft as well or the final application. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, then next item uh, is uh, mental health crisis stabilization facility ball up discussion. We have uh, Bruce and Gil here. So come on, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, we actually, so uh, last week we presented the numbers with the different options that we had for alternates in submitting. Um, we had it laid out from option one through option four um, and had the different levels of um, what the actual uh, the actual funding shortfalls are on the different options and we were looking soliciting for um, steps forward um, and what alternates that we wanted to choose at this time gary you were going to talk a little bit about Yes, last week I had a chance to meet with the city of Spokane and uh, they had uh, some, some things to propose to us that would uh, make it attractive for us to select option three or four. And uh, Arian, if, if you're on the line, would you like to explain that? Uh, absolutely. Um, I know Tanya was going to try to join. I, I don't see her on the participants. Oh, there she is waving. Um, <clears throat> Tanya, just because you're speaking on behalf of consent from the city administration, do you want to share the proposed um, uh, funding and then I'll fill in from the project side? Um, sure, thank you. It was a very productive meeting um, that we talked about and the city is very supportive of moving forward with option three or four and is willing to fund up to $1.1 million of that construction cost. So I think, um, I mean, that's just the, the bottom line of it. We're ready to support and, and help the county move forward in this project. Commissioners, if you would like to review what option three and four are, um, if I could um, be allowed to share my screen, um, I can revisit that. <clears throat> All right. So, um, share. All right. So, uh, to revisit, um, these were the options that Gil um, and Gary went to uh, through as far as a functionally viable facility. And <clears throat> after the conversation with Gary and Tanya, the city um, felt that they would be able to contribute the up to 1.1 million for option three or four that gives all of the programmatic alternatives to allow us for the full set of services um, with Medicaid reimbursements as originally intended in the design documents. So um, that would be a 1.1 million um, free and clear, there would be no sort of, um, uh, you know, capital repay that we were originally talking about <clears throat> ahead of time. I believe Gary uh, reviewed some county options um, in addition to the 1.1 million from the city uh, in order to um, ensure full coverage of uh, option three or four if, if desired uh, by the commissioners. Gary? Uh, yes, when I talked to Tessa, we looked at the mental health sales tax that we had left in the general fund for 2019, and it was a little over a million dollars. And uh, when we were taking a look at, uh, in particular, option four, uh, with, with our contribution of a little over a million and the city's contribution that would fully fund option four. And again, like you said, Arian, there's no strings attached to the city contribution, no no bill backs to any of the other cities. And so I think that that would be a, a, an option to, to be carefully looked at. Okay. 
So that would fully fund option four then. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thoughts, either Mary or Josh. So I, I heard Gary say that there are no, no strings attached with the with the city money. No, no preferential pricing or something for use of the facility. Nothing, no, no, nothing like that. Um, you are correct, um, Commissioner Kearns. Uh, the city is just it. It's very exciting to have a project like this um, finally get here. And I think just my time with the county, it's it's been a long time coming. The further it's de delayed, the the more costly it will be overall. So this is really the best benefit. So the city is anxious to move forward and is willing to put up the 1.1 million to pay for half of the outstanding cost for option four to get all the services that we all, I think we all believe will be most beneficial to the community. Um, yes, with no strings attached. Um, one little caveat that I'll say is that if costs start to appear to go beyond that amount, that we all kind of collectively come back to the table and talk about what that is and what the options are before moving forward. But I think that that is, is a very common understanding. Okay. You've got a pretty good contingency in there too. Yeah. And yeah. about 10% is yeah. pretty healthy. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, Josh? Uh, Mary? So, um, so I guess, you know, that's partly on, on Gil and, and Bruce to be managing that because, I, you know, I don't feel like we're going to have a lot of extra money to if it goes over over budget. And I know you've got the contingencies and all that, but I would say we're going to need to have a plan as to if if costs as, as they do site costs and all of that, and we know costs are going to you know increase. That we know what what potentially we're you know is is on the chopping block to keep it you know within that that range because I don't really want to be hitting the general fund. Um, you know the mental health crisis stables or the mental health sales taxes specific purpose so i mean so it can go for this purpose but i don't want to end up paying the general fund um so so i just want to be aware that we're paying attention and we know what would be coming out of that option for if we needed to fortunately i can see this project right out my office window so, <laughs> <laughs> so but i want to have you pre-think through if we do option four and if costs start to escalate, what would be the things that would come out of that? Yep. And, and again, then like Tanya said, we can we can talk to the city, but I'm, you know, I want to make sure we're we're we know where we're at on it. So, yeah, Carrie. Tanya, can I ask a question? So, what's what I'm uh, having the expectation from the state is that we have letters of commitment for the funding. So could I get a letter from the city that they would commit to that to submit to the state? Is that possible? Yes, I will do what I can. I'll talk to uh, Mike Ormsby even today to get something to give that confirmation and that commitment. Um, I think when we were, uh, Gary and Arian and I were talking on Friday, we believed that an ILA was going to be required as well from because this is a large sum of money from the city. So the city will certainly require an ILA be done, but you're spot on. We're going to get right on that. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Oh, Carrie, very quickly, if I may, what's your time frame on that? As soon as, you, as, soon as a decision is made, with, uh, if a decision okay. is made today, the sooner the better, because then I can send those in to the state. And right now I have no contracts on, on all three grants until we have, the we were waiting for the final budget and then a commitment from everyone that I have to submit to. Okay, to um, I'll move it as the top priority then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the only question I have is um, uh, out of the, uh, so the one, the one million dollars out of the mental health uh, sales tax, is that, um, uh, I don't, I think surplus might be the wrong term, but uh, is that additional revenues that that fund has acquired or are those reserves that have been established over a period of time and we're using the reserves here? And how will that impact potentially funding of programs for next year when sales tax revenue is going to be down? 
Uh, those are good questions. Uh, the the uh, million dollars came from that particular year that was unspent, and so it remained in the general fund. And it doesn't have a bearing on what we're committing to in the future for 2020, 2021 of that tax. So there's okay. no overhanging issues with using that fund. Great. Thank you, Gary. Chairman French. Yes. Uh, may I ask a question, Chairman French, since I'm working with Mr. Kaufman and, and Gary on the ILA, is it my understanding, Tanya, that the city's contribution of up to $1.1 million for option four is conditioned on the county contributing an equal amount from the mental health sales tax toward option four? That is correct. So let me follow that through. So I'm looking at Gil, if I could, Chairman French. So I assume then that the option four alternates that we're talking about, the cost of those alternates is approximately $1.1 million. Is that correct, Gil? No, For, no, 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 not, no, it's, it's where we set the overall budget on that was, is that we actually for option four with the base bid and all the alternates, the shortfall was 2.1, a little over 2.1. So. so, so I guess, so I know there was a shortfall from the original grant amount of 300,000. Is the city participating in that shortfall of 300,000 or only in the alternatives that we're talking about? Gary, am I um, saying that correctly? I've seen that. No, it's just the whole thing. Jim? I, yes. So I just shared the screen again, and if you look at the bottom, the funding shortfall is all inclusive. Yeah. And what this agreement is proposing is that we essentially divide that by two and a little bit for good measure and round numbers, and the city and the county contribute basically half of the complete total funding shortfall for the entire capital portion of this effort a understood Arian. so there's a three hundred thousand dollar shortfall originally plus the alternates is the total amount is that correct Gil? Yes, so it. that yes. wasn't made clear to the county commissioners that they would be participating for that from their 1.1 million dollar match is that correct gary i'm jim i'm so that that original funding shortfall the 316 yes. That is included in the 2.1. I understand that, but the board, I was on, they were understanding it was just for the alternates and it's the alternates plus the $300,000. Sure that's the clarity. That's saying. See, that's, a, that's, that's just fine. Oh. Okay. See what I'm saying? Okay. So I just wanna be sure that when we do the ILA that that's made clear. That's okay. why I was asking that question. Sure. Next question. Well, Are, before you get yeah. away from that. So the all in, all oh, yeah. options, everything, you know, uh, all in is 9.3 million. Correct. Okay. We're all in. That all in. Okay. With a 2.168 shortfall, we're going to split with the city. Yep. Okay. Correct. All right. I think you've got it. <laughs> there you go. Jim, did that answer uh, your question? Thank you, Chairman French. And I saw I have one further question. So the numbers for the option for Gill. Are they based upon the bid amounts that we received? And so therefore we can look to those as to those costs and maybe they come in over. And I think that's what Arian was talking about to the extent that they're gonna exceed that, the city and the county would sit down to address those additional costs over the 1.1 that each would contribute. Yes. Okay. Correct. Thank you, Chairman French. I You're now welcome. understand in more detail. You're welcome. And that, that that all in 9.3 million includes a 10% contingency on the base bid. Yes. Yes. Correct. Okay. All right, so we've got wiggle room. So it's decision time, ladies and gentlemen. What would you like to do? Can you give me the screen again, Ron? I can't see who's, who wants to talk and who doesn't. Mary? I'm, I'm fine with it. But okay. like I said, it was just my comment earlier that I want to make sure that we're we're monitoring it. And if, you know, I don't want to see us go over. So if, you know, if we need to 
look at what options are coming out. We need to just, you know, think of that ahead of time to know, and hopefully we don't have to get there. Okay, thank you, Mary. Josh? Yeah, no, I think it sounds like we've got a plan here that's it's going to work and uh, allow us to move forward on the full build out. Okay, so uh, Mr. Kaufman, Mr. Emacio, do we uh, need a resolution then to accept the contract and authorize or uh, you guys certainly can't go through and do great things without a, some kind of affirmation for the board. Uh, what does that look like and when can we expect it? Well, Chairman French, uh, you can do it either two ways. Number one, Mr. Kaufman and I have been, have a draft ILA in place. I don't think it'd be ready for tomorrow. We'll be ready for the following week. So you can wait until it's on the agenda. Or number two, you could move to authorize the chair or a majority of the board to execute at other than an open meeting an interlocal agreement between the city and the county consistent with the presentation that we received from Arian and particularly the items placed on the screen. What would be your pleasure? Yep, I will make a motion as stated by Jim Amacia. I will second that. Okay, I've got a motion in a second. Any discussion? Any stress? Okay. <laughs> All right, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Go forth and do great things and don't spend too much money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice job, you guys. Jared, Thank you very more. much, Commissioners. What, what? Nice job. Oh, Thank hold you on, hold on a second, second everybody. Wait a minute. Uh, Jared, Jared has one more thing to add to the project. Yeah. Yes, sir. How does October 2nd sound for a groundbreaking ceremony, everybody? Ooh, like provided. it. Perfect. Well, and commissioners. Yep. yep. Does that work for Mary and Josh? I mean, Tanya, how about your city folks? It's our party. They might want to be there. Yeah. Um, I, I can check with the city. I how about if I give um the commissioners uh, a day or twenty four hours to think about who they would want there and how they would like it to go and and I'll look to Arian or Gary to get back to me on that. And I'll try to arrange and, and help coordinate whatever uh, the commissioners would like. And could you also, 9, 9.30 to 10 is what I was thinking. I mean, we've done a few groundbreakings and ribbon cutting ceremonies during the new normal of COVID. And it seems to be the time and actually the day that works well for these type of things. Tanya and I can take that back to city administration um, as well as council based on the invite list that the commissioners provide um, with that day and time as an option. So we, uh, so when you, so everybody and his brother will be invited. Are you talking about who's going to speak at the event? We'll decide that. I would leave that up to you, commissioner. Okay. We'll All right. We will, we will, uh, we'll put something together and get it off to you here in the next day or two about a structure yeah that's fine just i think everybody should know that well, while everybody is invited we are kind of being strategic about how our invitations are sent and worded because of the restrictions around right. social distancing yeah. right okay i think we might want to televise it via zoom or city channel five or something like that so that's always an option for more engagement for some of our uh partners in the community yeah, we'll record it, but I would certainly invite City Channel 5 to be there as well. Yeah, we'll do something on site. Uh, you know, so there'll be a, a live uh, groundbreaking as well as uh, recorded and televised. Commissioner French? Yes. And hey, Dan, this is John. Um, as far as that groundbreaking, it's probably not a bad idea. The work we're doing right now with Providence and MultiCare um, but also maybe some of our MCOs. Would you recommend some folks, at least a representative from each? Thank you. Oh, you're on mute, buddy. Okay, thumbs up. We can, we have okay. those. And Jared, do you want those ahead of time uh, between Dan and, and myself for the 
more healthcare centric folks? The commissioner's consideration. Yep, for the yep. consideration. I just need to know a list of people who are speaking is all I need. Okay. Very yeah, good. I, would say, I, I would say that they just did the uh, virtual ground or opening for the catalog opening and that was, I mean, they just had like five people there that did the speaking and, and did a live stream and then it was recorded for others. But um, yeah, I think we just be careful how many people we have actually at the event. Okay. Anything else? Terrific. Let's go start down to nails. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So, next item. Uh, thanks, gents. Uh, next item is CARES Act funding. Carrie. Good morning. I think uh, we have visits for Cam. Um, there's a. Perfect. Meg, are you there? We are. Okay. Good morning. And, and I think Gina got your presentation, so we're going to provide an update to the board on what's been going on. Great. I'm going to thank you for the opportunity. We're super excited. We've already gotten some amazing responses from this. Jamie and his team just did a fabulous job with this, and so we're super excited to show all of you all this. Some of you, this will be the second and probably the third time you see it because we will be doing it at our annual meeting on Thursday as well. But we felt that um, we wanted to do a special um, presentation for you all um, since you so graciously um, gave us the money for this. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie. Um, hello everyone. Um, I am uh, Jamie Rand, again, the Chief Marketing Officer of Business Spokane. Uh, today I thought I would just provide the, the, the County uh, commissioners with an update on where the hospitality recovery campaign is currently to date. Uh, so, whoever is uh, driving this uh, presentation, um, I, is, it, is it possible for me to do it or no? I, um, let me uh, let me try to do it this way. I think it'll be easier if I'm able to. There we go. Um, so. Basically, uh, so um, so as we move through here, I'm going to just kind of give you some explanation and rationale for why we did what we did and then what the results are. Um, as you can see, we've had a couple of iterations of the campaign. It started with Ready to Roam when we were in phase one, uh, and then now the campaign message has moved to Room to Roam. Uh, we have modeled our messaging um, off of a Destinations International matrix that was provided us by kind of our, our mothership organization. Um, and so far, so good. It's, it's been very successful. Um, we have um, explored options for a third phase three or phase four messaging campaign, but I don't think uh, right now we really need that. I think Room to Roam will hold up in, in, in both phase three and phase four um, as we get there. Um, I did want to provide a little bit of rationale for the creative direction uh, and why we went this direction. The question that we get asked the most is why the animals? Um, and, 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 and why internally we kind of joke about the fact that, you know, humans aren't having a really great year, so animals make more sense. Um, there, there is some very specific, um, um, you know, rationale around it. First of all, we, we had an organizational review and they said that we needed to kind of break outside the box, be a little bit more creative, stop with just the seasonal campaigns. Um, the illustrated characters actually check a diverse set of boxes for us um, when messaging in a pandemic. Um, the first of which is, is, is having to, to put people in masks uh, during the creative. Um, um, doing this is not only unappealing, uh, but they also assure that the assets can never be used again. Um, I, you know, I might be an optimist, but I'm hoping that one day we will have a, a world where we don't have to wear masks in public again. Um, and when that day comes, obviously the creative would be uh, obsolete uh, because we would have people in masks. Uh, room to Rome. Pretty much is sums up everything people want right now, especially when coming from the Portland and Seattle markets because of, of, of the situation that both Seattle and Portland are dealing with uh, um, uh, amongst this pandemic. Um, the animals kind of lend themselves to character development and brand development in the future, which as an organization we're excited about. But most importantly, you know, they're whimsical, they're fun, uh, they're unexpected. And, you know, and standing out does come with some inherent risks. Um, but if, if, but we think that, that doing this is going to be necessary to be able to separate ourselves so far. So. Why don't you just mention that? I, I just wanted to mention really quickly. He got an email, a text from a couple on the south side. I don't want to. Yeah, on the Seattle it. south yeah. side this morning. Yeah, saying that they were so excited. They were just watching TV. The, the, the 
um, video came on that you all will see and how much they liked it. They loved the music, that it was spot on for everything and to congratulate us. So those things don't happen. So we're like high-fiving each other because those are the kind of things that make all the difference. They really do. And it happens very rarely. So what I'm going to show you today is basically the execution of what you paid for by media type. And then I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have uh, at the end, or you can um, stop me at any point. I'm, I'm happy to answer. So uh, we'll start with print. Uh, these are just a couple of our print ads. Keep in mind that everything I'm showing you today, there's more of them. Uh, there's just only so many that can fit on a presentation. So um, our, our idea with print here is that AAA Western Journeys is the highest circulation travel publication uh, in, in the Pacific Northwest. So we use that as kind of the overarching uh, print publication, and then we narrowed them in by market. So 1859 um, and 1889 uh, target Portland. Northwest Travel and Life, again, is, is more of a reaching, and then we narrow down with Seattle Magazine and Seattle Transit to target the Seattle markets. Um, overall, the combined circulation of the published publications we chose to, to go into cover Washington, Oregon, Montana, Idaho, California, and D.C. Um, Google search is another tactic that we use. We're spending, um, we'll end up spending several hundred thousand dollars in this category. Uh, dynamic and, and responsive display ads have been our primary tactic within Google search. Essentially, if you're searching or looking for anything about travel around the Pacific Northwest or anywhere in the area, we're gonna retarget you with, with ads that, that are more content driven, uh, that look more like news articles. Um, and they're, again, uh, because we are still in phase two, they are focusing on, on a lot of, of outdoor activities. I would say that this is probably one of our categories that with more money, we could probably make a much bigger impact as the intent increases. Um, um, one of the things that we know right now is that intent for travel is still, is still um, re relatively low compared to where it's been. And so without a ton of intent, right, these ads don't get served as much, but we do think that this tactic could be better funded, or if it was better funded, it, it could work a lot more effectively as we move through this pandemic, especially if it went into 2021. Um, digital display, so these are the ads that basically make people kind of feel uncomfortable at times, right? These are the ads that follow you around the internet uh, that you think that when the phone sounds, seems like it might be listening to you. Uh, we do not do those kind of ads. I'm not even 100% sure that those exist, but these are definitely contextual retargeting, search retargeting, if you're searching for anything close to anything that looks even remotely close to a vacation or a trip anywhere near Spokane uh, County, we're going to reserve these ads to you. Um, this tactic has has booked the most rooms, uh, room nights out of our total. Um, and, and it's because we're, we are catching people um, that are of high interest, at, at, at least in the moment. Um, social media and, and native advertising, native, uh, social media, everyone is pretty familiar with. This is Facebook, Instagram. Uh, for us primarily. Uh, the ads have been very successful. We've gotten a lot of great feedback on them. And then on the right, what you're seeing is native and Outbrain. Uh, we use a, a vendor called Outbrain uh, and native advertising is essentially if you live in Eugene and you open the Register Guards website and you're gonna read about the articles local to you, we would be serving these native ads uh, on those kind of websites, on publisher websites, uh, and they're intended to look like native or advertorial copy. Again, you can see we're still focusing on the outdoors hiking and, and biking and, and kayaking, trying to get people out and moving uh, because we know that that will eventually translate into room nights. And it is the safest thing for our community at, at, at this phase. I would say social media is another one uh, that I think that, you know, with the amount of money we have um, is, is, is okay. And I think that if, if we have more money, again, moving into 2021 would be the best opportunity for social media as the, the consumer interest continues to improve. Um, so then we, we decided to go with a poster campaign. So the outdoor, the, I knew that we needed a substantial amount of money to be able to do, um, you know, paid traditional advertising in markets as big as Portland and Seattle. Um, our initial campaign, poster campaign, uh, was we, we looked at also going into markets like Missoula and Boise and actually more into Portland if, if we could. Uh, but, but we had several different um, um, versions of this creative. Uh, and, and, and the one thing that I will say, just to make sure the county commissioners know that we spent the money wisely, is we, we definitely took into consideration where these boards are at and the changing consumer behavior uh, that, that exists, uh, especially right now. So we call these pandemic proof locations, meaning there are locations that we think will be relevant, they're relevant right now, 
But as consumer behavior, if we're assuming it's going to go back to like it, what it used to look like, there will still be relevant even after the pandemic. So it doesn't cost us increased production charges. Um, but this is a, a definitely a category that, I mean, I would love to have gone into Missoula in Boise, um, and, but at, you know, when we started looking at what the budget was that we had, we pared it down and really focused on Portland and Seattle because we thought they were the biggest opportunity markets. William Yeah, and then and then so this is I ninety campaign. So what we did instead of trying to put you know a, a just a few billboards in Missoula and Boise, we focused really on the I ninety corridor as well. So we have what we call catch advertising and driving advertising or pushing advertising. So this is literally just intended to get that that drive market. We anticipate that consumer behavior, especially as it um, as it revolves around the leisure family vacation is going to change because kids are not having to go to school like they, they normally have. So with remote learning and all that, we anticipate our shoulder seasons are still gonna be um, fairly well-traveled uh, as far as um, leisure goes. So we wanna get the people off of I-90 that have driven by Spokane and I-90 50 times and never knew that there was a, a waterfall in downtown, right? So we're trying to get people with this off of the highway um, and into downtown. Now these go all the way up uh, I-90. So they, they, there's exits from downtown all the way exits on Argonne and Spokane Valley. So these, these really run the range and they get, they get visitors off at a myriad of different places uh, on I-90 that, that span the county. So it's not just downtown. Um, the next one was uh, that we chose to do was Seattle Transit. Uh, Seattle Transit, um, obviously it has a high, high visibility in Seattle. We wanted Seattle to be our, our primary focus market. Uh, we looked at this and then we looked at Portland uh, to do the, the buses and things downtown Portland. We felt like this was a better value. So we have two, two, two of them. We have Sound Transit um, and, and these, these are bus wraps and they run from Everett to Seattle and Bellevue um, reaching um, King and Snohomish counties. But the, the best part about these is that the routes that they run on, there's there's almost no billboards. So we did a lot of research on these routes. And so really in terms of the advertising or out of home advertising, this is about the only thing that those people will see on that route or anybody else. So it, it, it definitely makes it stand out. Um, and then King Transit, we have the side panels. Um, and, and, and the nice thing about this is that, that these buses do cover affluent areas like Bellevue, um, Redmond and Kirkland. Um, and, and we're really happy with these because of the amount of, of between these two buses, we the estimated amount of impressions is 42 million 500 impressions um, over the short amount of time that they will be in downtown Seattle, which is really an impressive amount. Um, and we felt like these were one of our, our best deals. I would love to, you know, to have the money to be able to do a very similar thing in Portland would be amazing. Uh, I think that um, visually the campaign is very striking, especially off of a screen. And I think that it would make um, a, a very big impact um, in Portland as well. Uh, so the last one and where a bulk uh, or quite a bit of the money went, $650,000 of the paid advertising budget went to OTT and broadcast. Um, there was, there's certainly a couple of schools of thought on this. One of, one of them is, you know, to try to avoid this, this category because of the election, right? Because it's easy to get, it, it's, it's easier, I should say, to get bumped. Uh, we worked uh, a lot of, of, of tactical deals with a lot of the broadcast people that we worked with to ensure that Business Spokane spots don't get bumped from broadcast, and including sponsoring segments where the ads are running while there's still um, actual broadcast going on. So um, anyway, we've used a lot of different tactics. OTT is a great buy right now. OTT is like Hulu or Peacock or any of those streaming services that you're getting in your home when, you're, when you have ads. Um, the reason why they've gone up is pretty obvious. Everybody's in their home. Um, and, but the, the nice thing is, is that the rates haven't caught up to the increase in subscriptions. And so OTT ends up being a really, really good buy um, because it's the, the rates simply haven't caught up to the pandemic level. So this is the 30 second spot that we have. I will say with OTT, you can see that the, the markets that we're in, we cut Boise uh, and, and, and obviously uh, Calgary never got around. This is another area that with a couple hundred thousand dollars more uh, once um, ca um, Canada opens up, and, and, and so it would be nice to be able to go into Boise and Calgary and increase our spend in Portland as well, because uh, I'll show you in the data in a minute here that Portland has been the, the most significant market um, in terms of growth. So this is the 30 second spot. We have three more coming. Most of them focus on the outdoors. The, they're intended to be fun, right? Um, and make people happy 
um, because not a lot of people are, are as happy as they used to be. Uh, hopefully this works, please work. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Uh, so that's that's our first 30 second spot it focuses on obviously outdoor hiking and biking uh, we will also have another 30 second spot that the next one is going to focus on uh, Mount Spokane and Green Bluff. Um, and so we're trying to stay outdoors. We're trying to pace it. Um, if we have an opportunity, if we do move into phase three, as we're in the development of these videos, we will, we will, we will um, change directions and make sure that the, the content that we have for these videos are appropriate for phase three. Um, but we're trying to, the one nice thing that the outdoor part of it has been able to do is it, 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 is it, 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 it's much easier to reach the whole county and market the whole county, especially when you're focusing on outdoor activities. So uh, we've really tried to focus our efforts on the best things to do outdoors that, that cover um, a large part of our, of our county. So um, the next part um, is the website that we built. So all of this, all the media, all the money that we're spending, about 75 to 80% of it is going back to room to roam spokane.com uh, is a website that was built out basically to do one thing, and that's to sort inbound traffic from the campaign to the places that we want people to go. This is Spokane.com is a big website, it has a lot of stuff to do, and a lot of that stuff that we have on there to do right now is, is either on hold or is not happening. So we wanna make sure we can curate an experience that they can come and actually have. Because the last thing that we wanna do is set up a visitor with an expectation that cannot be met by the market because we are not ready. And so this website has helped curate and make sure that the visitors that are coming understand what they can do, what is safe, and what is open and available. Um, and so far the website has worked out very, very well. It is the number one referring website of any website um, to visit Spokane.com at this point. Um, and then, so these are kind of our result highlights. Um, there's a couple of, or a few very major things that have never either, either never happened before or at an all time high. The first of which is, is the 150,293. That's the amount of people that visited visitspokane.com in, in, in just the month of August, um, which is an incredibly high number. Uh, in fact, it is the most people that have ever visited visitspokane.com in the history of the domain. Um, and it is the most, it is by far the most, as you can see below, uh, maybe you can see it, 80,000 80, visitors in July to visitspokane.com was the second highest ever in history. Of, of 2018, so 150,000 is almost double the highest that the domain has ever had. So in terms of the amount of people discovering Spokane, seeing Spokane, visit Spokane for the first time, there is an incredible amount of people uh, that, are, that are discovering Spokane and, and the, what the Spokane area has to offer for the first time. Um, 1.84 million is the amount, uh, and this was as of last Friday. It, it is probably closer to 2 million at this point. Um, and so we've booked 1.84 million um, in terms of attribution from our, our, our DARA technology that basically says if they click or engage on an ad and book a room in Spokane or Spokane County, anytime within 30 days, uh, we get attribution. Um, I, what I will say is that the booking, well, we'll get to that in a minute. The last thing and most important thing is the hotel occupancy. This is a number we're really proud of. Uh, the hotel occupancy, the Saturday over Labor Day weekend was over 70% in downtown, and it was even higher than that in the county. The reason why I put the downtown number on here is because Spokane Valley and the, and the rest of the county has fared much better overall uh, throughout the pandemic in terms of occupancy than downtown. So to hit 70% in downtown, which is only 22% under last year, and only in a pandemic would 22% down be a, a positive thing. Um, it's, it's, it is far, far higher than the 20, 30% that our partners in Seattle are seeing over Labor Day weekend. So we've almost doub doubled the occupancy of our competitive set in terms of leisure um, over the Labor Day weekend. The, the smoke, obviously, it, we expect to have an impact on, on travel, but as you can see, right, it's starting to clear and we're, we're going to kind of market right through it. 
and hope that it continues to, to be successful. Um, so before you leave that, uh, when you're talking about 70% occupancy, that 70% occupancy of those hotels that were open, not of our total inventory of hotel rooms. Is that right? That is accurate. Correct. That is correct. Okay, so I just want to make sure the board's clear that, you know, Walt Worthy only has one of five hotels open. So no, he's got, they're all open. All five of his are open currently. When did he open the, when did he open the others? Um, July. It, it was like the July. very end of July. Right, there's only okay. a handful of ones in the downtown area that are currently not open. Jerry, okay. Ruby, the Ruby hotels are not open. Jerry, two of Jerry Dicker's hotels. And I think there's one limited service, but everybody else is open downtown. Okay, all right, I did not know that. Thank Which is you. pretty good. And, and, and to be to be 100% transparent, the Rubies don't um, report to Adara data anyway. So the Ruby hotels not, have never been in this data because they're independent. Um, we're like Doubletree is a Hilton and the Marriott. They report numbers to our, our third party program. So um, the Ruby would never affect this number, unfortunately. Um, so last, the last things then is, so if we look at the, what the breakdown is, right, out of the 1.841 million, 84% of those room nights are in Spokane, 10% of them are in Spokane Valley, and 6% are in Liberty Lake. Uh, while, the, while the discrepancy looks um, bad, it's actually not, it's better than it usually is. Usually the valley ranges somewhere between 7 and 8%. In, in Liberty Lake, somewhere between four and five percent. So it's actually more even than it's ever been uh, in, in the reporting. Um, and then you can see our top origin markets. Uh, Seattle and Tacoma is, is number one, which isn't totally um, different. But what I will say, what is amazing to me is Portland. So believe it or not, Portland, in the three years I've been here, Portland has never made the top 10 as an origin market, which always blew my mind because it's only a few hours away. And I figured that it just made sense. But Portland being in the second, number two, is a, is a testament, I think, to, to their market and our campaign messaging together. Um, Spokane doesn't mean the city of Spokane. These are all DMAs, meaning designated marketing areas, bro broken up by Nielsen. The Spokane DMA is actually geographically quite large and goes all the way to the border of Canada. So when you see Spokane, what you're looking at there is the rural communities around Spokane. So here's my assumption about this data that I don't know if it's true or not, but hopefully by the time this all sorts out, um, it will it will turn out to be accurate. What I'm what I'm suspecting is happening is that Spokane always used to be number one because most of the leisure visitation was coming from the rural communities around Spokane, right? Um, but now being urban is not as popular as it was before the pandemic. So I think some of those rural communities have backed off their visitation to downtown Spokane because they look at Spokane the same way we look at Seattle, like, ooh, that's not a place I would really want to go. But the exact opposite happens for Seattle and Portland, where they're much more urban areas and they see Spokane as a more rural area, Spokane County is a more rural area. So it, it, in, in some ways it makes sense to me that the visitation is coming from there. And the last thing that I would like to point out, which is still, I think, indicative of consumer behavior, is that the, from, from this number right here, the nine days from first search to book, from when someone used to come to visit Spokane.com or, or see our ad, it used to take them four hours to book a room, right? Which for most people, that's one web search, right? You're doing a little research, going to different websites. It could take two, three, four hours. Now it takes nine days. The difference between four hours and nine days is a substantial amount of time in terms of a consumer making a decision about whether or not to book a room. The wavering consumer confidence is still, to me, quite obvious. Uh, and, and, and because of that, we have adjusted the budget and our tactics to go out and get people because we know that the intent is still pretty low. Um, so that is everything that we had to, to show you today. And I would be happy to answer any questions that anybody has or go back to any slides if you want to see something else. And I just have one comment to make really quickly is I'm, I'm um, on multiple phone calls with um, our different cities and our different partners across the, the state. and. Seattle was just awarded $8 million from their CARES Act, and they are frantically putting together, they're gonna launch on October 1st um, with their campaign, and they're going to be looking mainly up and down the coast since they're such a large area, but they are gonna creep into ours. So the competition is starting to already become fierce. We know that people are gonna be putting a lot of funding out there 
a lot of messaging. And exactly what Jamie said is we've got to stay in front of everyone's mind as much as possible with all of this integrated marketing across so that we can, we can they see us, they know that we're a viable, we're a safe destination to come to and an exciting destination to come to. So that's why we're pushing all these different levels to get as much in front of people as many times as possible as we move forward. Okay, so uh, any questions for our guest, either Josh or Mary? Mary? Um, I just wanna say, I think it's great. I mean, it's amazing to see what the impact um, has been already. And um, so I know, you know, I've been talking to the Valley and, and Liberty Lake, and I knew that their numbers were, were holding pretty well for, for their uh, area, but I'm, it's just great to see downtown Spokane doing the same with their hotels. So I just want to say, you know, thank you for all your efforts and, and being creative and thinking through how to you know, continue this even after the pandemic, you know, so I think that's a great way, you know, to, to, to do it, you know, and not have a mass on the animals and all of that. So, um, so no. So I just want to say thanks. You guys are doing a great job. Thank thanks, you, Mary. Josh? Yeah, so I, I got a sneak peek of this presentation last week at the Visit Spokane board meeting, but um, just well done. Uh, you, you are all working so hard and you're doing a great job and uh, just proud to be able to partner with you on this. Thank you. And I just, if I have, can have a moment, I just really need to do a shout out. Carrie has been the most remarkable partner to work with. She has, and I know Jer is going to echo what we say, is that she has been nothing but a pleasure to work with. She has found solutions for us. She comes back so quickly. We cannot thank her enough for all she's done to help with, um, it's, it's a big, it's been a big task for all of us, but she has made it just so easy for us to get through all this. And we just can't say enough about how much we appreciate her and all she's done. Truly. Thank you. And we look forward to having all of you all on our annual meeting on Thursday so we can honor you and thank you once again in public for um, supporting us with this. Thanks, Meg. So, uh, nice presentation. The only observation I would make is that on your uh, uh, bus advertising, uh, especially in the Seattle market, since they are still uh, working remotely, uh, sound transit uh, from the numbers that I saw significantly down in terms of ridership, but you might look at the ridership uh, for uh, uh, Pierce County uh, Transit and also Everett, uh, okay. because that's where that more affluent market lives, and that's the market I think that you would probably be going after. So you might yeah. look at what the distribution is on uh, on the ridership and what what the makeup is and, and who that market is that you're going after. You might get more bang for the buck out of uh, uh, Pierce and Everett than you are out of King County. And then uh, don't ignore the Vancouver, Washington uh, uh, market as well, because that's the bedroom community for Portland. And Portland is also, well, it's just a blaze and stuff. So uh, there's not a lot of traffic going on there. So that might be another opportunity to uh, increase your message. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I like that. No, those are good suggestions. I, I'm pleased that my fellow commissioners caught that. So thank you. Uh, so other than that, great job. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Very good. So Jer's with us. How are you this morning? You were going to do a presentation, Jer, for the board on what the Inlander is doing. And Gina's passing out your first guide. Oh, that's great. Uh, good, good morning, commissioners and everyone. Um, I wanted to focus on the Inlanders Back to Business Community Support Project this morning. And we have a PDF file that I think we're going to pull up on the screen. There we go. Um, and before I jump into Back to Business, I just wanted to mention that uh, the Inlander also worked on a nonprofit support project. We partnered with the Novia Foundation and Horizon Credit Union, um, and we supported about 100 nonprofits in our annual Give Guide. We also launched a thing we called the Give Guide Initiative, and you can see the web address listed there of how to access the Give Guide Initiative. But that will help uh, support with volunteering opportunities and wish list item fulfillment for area nonprofits. 
what we identified early on was was uh, obviously the hospitality sector was going to be the hardest hit, but that nonprofits were challenged. This isn't part of the partnership uh, with the CARES funding. This was something that we were able to set up separately. I just wanted to draw some attention to that um, as an important sector that we also worked on. And then diving into back to business, I know it's been a little while since we've talked. Um, I can tell you, we've been working hard over here. Um, and I'll read through this again. We, we read this before, but hospitality focused businesses need an increase in awareness and activity to support recovery, but are financially challenged to build awareness. This collaborative community effort uh, was developed by public and private organizations to create a targeted business promoting effort with no direct cost to local businesses affected by the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think a lot of, uh, you know, Visit Spokane has taken on the task of, of reaching outside of the market and driving um, folks to check out Spokane, come over here, visit, stay in our hotels. And Inlander was tasked with supporting local businesses, uh, keeping business activity up. I'd like to just mention the partners, uh, specifically STCU and Washington Trust, um, but DSP, Visit Spokane, West Plains Chamber, Greater Spokane Incorporated, Spokane Valley Chamber, Inlander. Um, this was also supported by Avista. And then we've made mention um, with partners throughout that, that this was also supported by Spokane County and the CARES funding that, that you all approved. Um, and then Inlander is the outreach media partner. I'm, I'll just read this. I'm not gonna read everything through the proposal but, or, or through the package, but the project uses the Inlander's unique community-focused business model as a tool to help the effort succeed. The Inlander has an established history of, of telling the stories of local businesses through its pages, supporting community efforts, and aligning with regional organizations to support community. The Inlander focuses much of its efforts on the hospitality sector, and has the capability to coordinate with hundreds of businesses, create content that represents affected business categories, professionally design printed and uh, digital materials, and circulate products throughout the entire regions, both in print and online. And that was in the proposal when we talked uh, several months ago. And so far, I think that we're accomplishing those things. We're getting information in front of people. We're writing dozens of stories about affected businesses. Um, probably one of the biggest things that we have going on is communicating directly with affected businesses in Spokane County. Um, and what's sort of surprised me is, is just some of those conversations and the, and the appreciation that they have that their community is being supported in this way, um, that something's happening, that, that uh, you know, the county is rising up and saying, here's something that we can do, here's a support way that we can create. And these are businesses that at Inlander we've worked with for, for decades, um, and to, to see those challenges has, has been hard. And so there's been three primary tools. On the right-hand side, you can see the percent change in Washington employment. We actually featured that in the Back to Business Guide to give readers a, an idea of just how challenged the leisure and hospitality sector has been and why there's uh, such, a, such an importance on, on finding a way to do business with these affected businesses. Um, and so the, the leisure and hospitality is down 43% from February to May. Um, the three primary tools that we have uh, generated is uh, the weekly back to business pages in the Inlander, the back to business guide series, which you guys have there, which uh, we'll start out focusing on restaurants, shift to shopping later, and then entertainment to close it out. Uh, this is volume one of seven guides that we're, we're intending to publish, and then a back to business website. We also created back end Google Forms for participants and to be a participant in the back to business program, you have to be in Spokane County and you have to fit into one of the affected categories. And, and we've been communicating with already hundreds of businesses and we'll continue communicating with hundreds more businesses to align with that. Um, and then as we scroll down, we'll look a little deeper at the back to business pages in the Inlander. Um, and then these are running, Every week in every edition of the Inlander, um, there's a feature article that focuses on, on different ways that people in the community can uh, reconnect with businesses. A lot of times it'll, it'll focus on a sector um, and it might end up talking about you know, seven or eight different businesses. <clears throat> in, the, in the pages, we also feature uh, business write-ups. So people can read a little bit of a longer piece on like in this one, the Longhorn Barbecue. Uh, we've also developed something we call the Fresh Sheet which is a space where Inland Northwest businesses can send in information to the Inlander, whether it's a deal 
a special or like a business update. Maybe they're reopening or they've expanded their patio, but they can create awareness around changes or activities or deals that they want to share with the Inland Northwest. It might be, you know, two for one pizzas on Thursdays, um, which that that's a driver. That's something that might get someone to call. And instead of stopping by McDonald's, maybe they're stopping by uh, that pizzeria. <clears throat> Every week we're also doing little special information boxes. And that's a space where, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, and this one we have the drive through food fair out at the, out of the, the uh, fair and expo. And I, I think what we're trying to accomplish there is just if there's things that the community needs to be aware of, maybe it's virtual blooms day or it's changes like that. We're, <clears throat> we're adding that information in there and then we're sharing that out through, through multiple channels. Um, and we're trying to make it real clear for people that uh, the partners involved were really impactful in making this happen. Um, <clears throat> sorry. And I think <clears throat> one of the side benefits of, of this program has been the ability to represent our community organizations and talk about some of the things that they do and create, a <clears throat> create awareness around what it is that those, um, each of those organizations does. And then in your hands, you guys have the Back to Business Guide Volume 1. <clears throat> we modeled that around um, some of what we do with Inlander Restaurant Week, which again is a great community event. Um, you know, very much so designed to be focused on restaurants, support the restaurant industry. And so we kind of followed the structure of that, but created much more uh, focus on individual businesses and then telling the stories of the Inland Northwest. Um, <clears throat> You can notice throughout there, you see a lot of these one six page ads. Um, those, those advertisements, uh, the, the businesses paid zero dollars to participate. That was uh, supported through the CARES funding um, and through the partners. There's also multiple feature articles uh, throughout there that help get that, that information out. In addition to it being a restaurant guide, it's also a drink local guide. Um, so it'd be purveyors of, of beer, wine, cider, spirits, um, we do have a requirement on that, that those be locally owned companies, 50% or more owners, 50% or more ownership here in the Inland Northwest. Uh, so the distribution of the back to business guide, it was inserted into the full run of the Inlander this week. And actually it ended up being the front cover of the Inlander and just telling directly people, which I was a little surprised that it ended up being the front cover, but it was great. Um, we have a picture of Brick West on our front cover showing tables sitting, you know, a certain amount of parts. So we've got social distancing, but really encouraging um, people understanding, getting back to business, getting out there and supporting your businesses. That's, that's sort of the big difference maker. So the special ongoing distribution that we have um, in litter community centers and area grocery stores, we, we uh, work with about 50 different area grocery stores. So we can consistently be having back to business guides out there. And so those will actually be these guides outside of the Inlander. So they're just separate. Uh, we, we, did, we did a pretty massive print overrun. Um, also partner distribution, STCU branches and more. Um, participant distribution. Every single participant uh, was delivered a bundle of these and they can proudly display those because they're in there and that's a way for them to support their, their fellow businesses. We also slipped a little piece of paper in there that, that reminded them who's supporting them, that this is supported by uh, Spokane County organizations. And that's, uh, that's a powerful tool. Um, we also have specialty racks that we're setting up in uh, high traffic areas, you know, places like malls and things like that. It's a, a kind of a trick we learned with restaurant week, a great way to get books out in front of people is just be out where the people are. Um, we'll also have them down at, at uh, the visit Spokane uh, tourism center. We also direct mail. We decided you know, it was, it's, it's an expensive effort to do, but we decided we wanted to direct mail about 4,000 copies of the first three editions just to kind of give it a jump start. Um, and we actually sent them out to the, to the uh, GSI direct mail list, which was kind of a great way to get that in front of people to remind people that, of the activity that's going on. But also we sent it out to area zip codes in Spokane County. And then we're also always looking for other distribution opportunities. As far as the digital guide, um, widely accessible. We have links from partners, links from participants, and links from other organizations. And then scrolling down to the next page. <clears throat> the third component 
is the Back to Business website, which is at btb.inlander.com. One of the main things, and then this gives you a little example of what the fresh sheet form looks like. So an area of business can just go in there, click on the fresh sheet form, go into the Google form, enter their business information, enter what their fresh sheet item is, whether it's like that two for one pizza or something else special that they want to create awareness around. And then, and that's a free service, obviously. And then we're able to go and take and broadcast that far and wide. Um, so we create awareness around some of these specials, deals and updates from businesses. Um, we're targeting hospitality focused businesses of the Inland Northwest. And then we want these to be short and to the point so that we can really get a lot of that information out there for people. Um, also on back to business.inlander.com, lots of shareable stories about area businesses, things that people can be linking to, um, re, uh, you know, reposting on websites and, and uh, creating a lot of access. We also have clear access to greaterspokane.com, visitspokane.com, kindnessnotcovid.org, inlandbizstrong.org. We have the digital back to business guides. We have other guides available, including the Visit Spokane tourism guide. Um, and there's a lot of business resources in there like Inland Biz Strong. One thing you'll probably notice is the color palette is uh, the exact color palette from Kindness Not COVID. Um, it's a great, great color palette, but it's sort of this, uh, it's a way to tie those two things together. This obviously was intended to be a little bit more um, accessible and fun. Um, and so we tried to go with that. And, and I think that the stories in the, in volume one are great. Um, we just, you know, we, we, we're trying to go out and create as much activity as we can. And then uh, lastly, on the back to business marketing side, promotional plans and usable marketing materials. Uh, we have our campaign messaging. We have a consumer campaign where it's pick up the back to business guides. We have check out the fresh sheet and weekly updates in the Inlander and on the back to business website. Um, on the participant side or other business effort, um, we're working on business to business to make sure that we're continuing to create awareness for those businesses that they can send in fresh sheet information. Um, and then also promoting uh, in up upcoming guides, letting businesses know this is a support access point that you have. And obviously working through partners like West Plains, uh, GSI, Visit Spokane and, and Spokane Valley for them to let their constituents know um, that these are available services. And then marketing support, uh, we're doing inlet of print and digital. Uh, we've got social media. We're doing uh, boosted posts on Facebook to access uh, a lot of these channels. Uh, we're also gonna work with local media. We have radio um, that will run in advance of each edition. Um, we have partners and participants, which that's one of the models we really learned um, from Restaurant Week. And it was, it was kind of wild back in 2013 when Restaurant Week first launched a lot of the restaurants didn't want to support the other restaurants. They, you know, they said, well, I, I just want to promote myself. Um, and so one of, the, one of the big differences was getting people understanding that when you promote yourself and the event in general, you promote your, they promote you, you promote them, it, it lifts everyone up. And that has actually taken hold. And I think that we've, we've found a lot more brothership and camaraderie between the restaurants since we kind of established that approach as, as a group putting on restaurant week, but we're seeing that happen again with back to business. Um, and then support opportunities, participants and other supporters, um, they can add graphics and links to the back to business website. They can include graphics, links to the email newsletter, uh, links to their own email newsletters, um, promote the program on social media channels and assist with distribution of the guide. And those are, those are widely available to any partners. Um, we have media, uh, little media kits that we can send out to people that gets them the information that they need. Um, and if any, if you guys know of anyone that we should be reaching out to to help expand the program, um, just have someone send it over to me. Um, and then I'll echo what Meg and Jamie said. It's been a joy uh, working with, with Carrie. It's, it's a difficult program to go through. And uh, when you read the contracts that you're signing, you, you, you feel like, you know, it makes you a little bit nervous, like, oh my gosh, you know, should I be signing this? And so she's, uh, <clears throat> she's been all over that and making sure that, that we're doing everything right and we're following all the policies and protocols and, and just been super. So, um, and that is, that's the back to business presentation so far. Okay, thank you, sir. So any questions, uh, Josh or Mary? Um, well, I just want to say I, I picked it up on Thursday when it came out. Um, I also got a copy sent to me, so thank you very much. Um, I think it's great. I think it's this is how we get to promote the businesses that are doing things well, 
um, you know, people are still scared. So, I mean, so it's, um, you know, great to see, you know, just getting those businesses back in front of people um, to say you can still do takeout I and mean, you can do all those things so you can still feel safe. So um, I just want to say thank you for doing that. I have one question though for you when I look through it. So, you know, one of the spots talked about milk kits to go. Um, and so it's going to be, you know, so I, but I was trying to figure out which, which restaurants are doing that. And so I don't know if there's a way that you're identifying that or not, um, or have a list on, online. Did you say meal kits to go? Yes. It talked about, I don't have to find it here. Um, kind of on page seven of it. Okay. Um, you know, where it talked about tools of the trade and then it's like local delivery, cocktails to go, online ordering, meal kits. Um, because especially with kids right now home, I think that's a great idea to to have that family activity of, you know, cooking together. So so I just thought that was kind of a great way to do it to, you know, restaurants that you may not normally go to, to they're doing a milk kit to go to, you know, then you're making it at home, kind of like the, um, I, you know, the different box meals that are being sent to homes. Um, I thought that was a great idea um, and a great way to do it, but it'd be, which restaurants are doing that? <laughs> so. That, that'll be easy to dig into. And I can say that um, as an organization, you know, we just work so closely with restaurants that we're continuing to look for ideas and opportunities and, and pathways to help and support um, those businesses now and kind of into the future as well. Um, and then we'll, as we roll out of the third volume, which will be the, the last of the restaurant volumes, we'll get into the shopping sector. And then that'll kind of get us into fourth quarter. Um, and we'll be working more on on, on kind of that emphasis piece. Um, and probably the one thing I, I would just add is the, the, the feedback that you get from, from the businesses of feeling supported. I think I mentioned that, but it's just, it, it's powerful for them to, to know that there's support coming. And, you know, even if, you know, this isn't the end all be all, but it's something, it's, it's a positive thing that's happening. Um, and that's been one of the more powerful things of hearing and, and sometimes kind of emotional. Um, businesses are on the edge in a lot of ways and, and sometimes that can tip them one way or the other if they know that they've got some support so I think that that's been something to note. Well thank you. Thanks Mary. Hey Josh. Yeah and I, I received a copy the other day um, and just great layout I n noticed right away that you know I mean and you had mentioned last last week at Visit Spokane at the Visit Spokane meeting that it, it was sort of fashioned after the restaurant week guides which I think everybody will agree is probably the happiest week uh, of the year, uh, restaurant week. So uh, it, it's just, it's a great layout. Um, it, it was just great looking, honestly, it was great flipping through the pages and seeing all those businesses that are now open because I mean, just when we, when we think back just a couple months ago, how many of them were closed, I mean, or, or just, you know, really hanging, hanging by a, hanging by a thread. And I know, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them still need help out there. And so that it was just, it's just great to see something like that out there accessible for people to, to really remind people. We've got a lot of, a lot of restaurants here that, that need help. And uh, quite frankly, they've got amazing food too. So, you know, kill two birds with one stone there. So uh, th thanks so much for, for this concept and for executing it so well. I uh, appreciate that, Josh. And, and, and please know we're going to continue working hard all the way through the entire program and, and, uh, the team is the team is dedicated so very good thank you sir thanks for the update thanks for all the great work you bet thank you okay carrie we're back to you next up um i think the commissioners was it two weeks ago jason or a week ago i'd lose track yeah, of time. something like that <laughs> uh jason uh provided an update and spoke to you about coming back um and talking to you about possibly putting in another ask for funding uh, to get us through the end and possibly stockpiling some food based on the numbers he's seen. So uh, Jason put together a, a letter, I think, and submitted to you on the 15th of uh, last week. And so he's here to talk about it today. And I believe Drew's on the line too. Is that correct? He is. That's so correct. Jason, take it away. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Carrie. It was, I appreciated hearing the tail end of the last presentation. I, I'm 
thank you for investing in the business community and jobs. We don't need more people to feed right now. So <laughs> I think that's a job is a good anti-hunger program. So thank you. Uh, so we are, um, and I'm a little nervous. I, I know the first time I came, uh, Al joked about, I was here to harvest for dollars. It really isn't my intention to keep asking you for support, <laughs> but the, the, the reality is um, we are still seeing record numbers of people and uh, kind of the, the short version of the story is we have been able to capture some additional sources of food through the federal government, but almost all of those are going to be going away over the next 30 to 60 days. And uh, the, the other kind of interesting challenge is our buildings are, you know, we have two facilities here in Spokane. They are completely full. We have we are constantly shuffling around just to manage what we're doing right now. So we have no space to store additional food, yet we know we have this huge need. And I, it would just be huge for the community for us to be able to build up a reserve uh, for late this year and even to trickle into early 21. Um, I would have four million pounds of food is a, would be a huge lift and we'd have to partner with an outside um, facility to store it and bring it in as we consume it. Uh, but we think we've put together a plan to do that. Um, one consideration is that the, the food supply chain is still pretty disrupted. And, and I, I'm seriously not trying to create artificial urgency here. We just have to get orders in in the next week to week and a half if we're going to land all these loads. And I'm talking about buying like 2,700 pallets of food. Um, we'd have to be really aggressive to get it moving to the community to beat the December 31 deadline. So um, I think we have the need. Uh, we'd have to execute really quickly to, to make this happen for the community. But, and as you'll notice, uh, the only thing we care about is buying the food. We're, we're figuring out how to, to cover everything else. So just wanted to put that in front of you all. And um, the last thing I'll say is we heard from you uh, particularly, uh, Mary brought it up, and it, we hear it again and again, a lot of concern about feeding families and kids um, and the school disruption. You know, I think we've learned that a lot of people rely on those school programs to feed their families, and we just really need to be stocked up to keep supporting the additional distributions we're doing at schools and, and for the weekends. So I'll, I'll stop rambling and to see if you have questions and what, uh, what I could share that would be helpful. Okay, Mary. Um, so yeah, so Jason, thank you for saying that because that was that was my concern with this was just making sure that um, as part of us giving these additional dollars that that part of that is ensuring that you've got the purchase of food uh, to get to those weekend programs that you know is so necessary and so you know with the federal government stepping up and helping fund the the day programs during the week, um, you know I, I just like to make sure that we're stepping up and providing that uh, ability to get those. Um, the, the food in and, and you, you seem to be the one who can do the purchasing so then it can get to those organizations that can distribute that. So, um, so I'm, I, I guess I just want to make sure that's part of this um, because I think that's really important and then um, just thank you for all you're doing. Oh, well, thank you. We've got a lot of wonderful people helping us do all this work and uh, that's absolutely a priority and we're making sure that our uh, everything from our school pantry partners uh, to the volunteers who are delivering to schools, we're making sure those trucks are always full and we want to be able to keep doing that. Um, and then can, can I use your, oh, sorry, can I, can I use your phone? I think this is the best way. I'll get some Try it again, Mary. I think. I'm not sure who's, but um, right. I'm just going to say. Try to do it well as you would. Hurry up. Okay, so Hurry whoever's down. on the line, can you mute your phone? We're getting some feedback and stuff. So, um, all right, Mary, go ahead. I was just going to say, Jason, can I use your quote that a job is, is the best anti-hunger campaign? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, <laughs> so I've been saying that for years. <laughs> I mean, it, it's so true, um, and especially in these times, and that's why, you know, doing everything we can do to help people stay in their jobs, and that's why we helped, you know, with the day camps for school districts so people could, you know, continue working. So 
So no, so I, I will be using that quote, but I'll quote it. Quote you. <laughs> oh, well, you don't have to give me credit, but we certainly, uh, I certainly believe that, you know, I think you have to pull all the levers in a, a situation like this, and we certainly don't want more folks uh, to be unemployed, that's for sure. Yeah, no, well, thank you. Appreciate all you're doing. Okay, Josh. Yeah, I just, you know, you, you gave a great presentation. Uh, every, every time you come in, you know, when you, that, that initial, that initial presentation, you showed us what the need was, you showed us where the food would go. And then when you came back and you showed sort of what you've done with it, I think you've, you, in my mind, you've, you've proven that, uh, you know, you, you utilize these funds wisely. You're committed to the, to the right cause and you're, you're very successful at, uh, at, at what you do here. So, um, you know, I'm I'm glad that you uh, you were able to put down some numbers uh, for for this ask, and you know, like I've I've said to folks, you know, no, no nobody should be going hungry uh, in, in in our community, and especially at a time like this, when um, you know, essentially that this is at no fault of their own. I mean, with with, with what everybody's facing. So, oh, thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, it's particularly particularly important right now. I mean, everybody was hoping that there'd be another. Uh, round of stimulus and that's not happening and probably won't happen until after the election and stuff and so the pressure for uh, keeping food on the table is uh, I think very acute here for the next uh, 45 to 60 days and stuff so thank you for all the work that you're doing to try and make sure that uh, you know nobody goes hungry uh, so at this point uh, uh, Commissioner Kearns do you want to go ahead and make a motion? Uh, gladly uh, Mr. Chair I move to approve and authorize the uh, expenditures of up to $4,398,000 um, to Second Harvest Food Bank as presented um, here in the, uh, in the ask here for CARES dollars. I will second that. Okay, I've got a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, ju See. Just just want to confirm that Carrie, Carrie Gridall, this, this is all acceptable. No, no issues here. Yeah, absolutely. Jason and I have Perfect. talked about a couple of things, but I think we've got that all resolved. I feel very comfortable with this. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passage unanimously. Thank you very mm. much. Again, Jason, thanks for all the work that you and your crew are doing. No, thank you all. We're humbled. Carrie, thanks for your help, and we'll, we'll do our best to keep feeding folks. Al, I'll try to resist asking you for money for a while. <laughs> <laughs> At least for the next hour. Yes. <laughs> well, next week. <laughs> yeah, next week. Oh, boy. No, I'll try to wait longer than that. Thanks so much. It might take care. <laughs> thanks, all right. Thank you so much. Okay. Next up is uh, Mr. David Baird. Spokane Fire Department? Spokane Valley. Spokane Valley Fire Department. David, you're on mute. We, we see you. We well, we don't even see you, but now, are you there? Good morning, how are you? Good, you're yourself. You're okay. on. I'm not great with this home office thing, so hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh, but yeah, so what I'm bringing to you today is a, a proposal to help Spokane Valley Fire Department um, expand our ability to respond to the public and in this time of pandemic that we're going through improve provider safety and uh, decrease exposure to providers and people and hopefully with doing all this improve still be able to improve patient outcomes uh, we feel very good about prior to the COVID-19 outbreak about what we were doing with cardiac arrest management even with some outdated equipment and that's really where uh, trying to mesh these two things together, uh, provide some, some extended protection to our providers with also some updated equipment um, and also hopefully improving patient outcomes. So uh, with this COVID outbreak, the Spokane Regional EMS put out a list of guidelines back in, let's see, what's the date on this? April 9th, 2020. And one of those guidelines was to limit the number of personnel in contact with a patient, with, with a suspected COVID patient. Now, 
I'm going to tie this to our cardiac arrest setting right now where prior to COVID and even still currently, we will have 10 to 12 EMS providers around the patient. They will be closer to the patient than many of you are sitting at that table that I can see or I could see just kind of camera just jumped on me a little bit, but we'll have 10 or 12 people around that patient. And if that's a, if that's a suspected COVID patient, the amount of aerosol that's being generated one from doing CPR and doing mechanical ventilation with a, a bag valve mask with or without an endotracheal tube, you, you know, we, the risk of exposure is pretty high with some of this equipment that that I that have submitted to you will allow us to greatly reduce uh, reduce the amount of exposure there. So I'll just kind of go through each piece of equipment. There's three big pieces in there and I'll explain how each one uh, ties in in both the cardiac arrest and in some of these in the non-cardiac arrest setting. So the first piece of equipment is the cardiac monitor which um, the product that I have sent submitted to you is called the X series. It's made by this is all these are all products made by Zoll. Uh, the X series is more than a cardiac monitor defibrillator. It'll uh, measure patient's heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, which as we know in COVID, that's a, one of our our uh, triggers is temperature, uh, oxygen saturation, blood pressure, and tidal CO2. It'll still do the 12 and the three lead EKG, which is uh, all of our cardiac monitors. Our current ones will do a lot of these things too, but the big one is the increased temperature and, uh, or, you know, being able to read the temperature. But the real cool thing with this X series monitor is that one person can do all this. You can set all these different things up on a patient and you potentially could stop, step back and then well, actually, you don't even have to record the data. If, if we were on a, a piece of paper, you could, but now we have a tablet and this X series actually syncs to the tablet and real time will update vital signs every whatever you set those parameters for every five minutes, every 10 minutes, whatever. So with that, you could do what right now is currently a three person uh, operation when we could do with one with uh, getting a patient evaluated and if it's a suspected COVID patient we could send one person in there uh, to do that. We're trying to do that now um, and do a lot of this stuff manually but I kind of look at the COVID patient and I hate to put it in these terms but I look at it almost like a hazardous material call and with a hazardous material call we look at there's three factors to keep people safe. One is you know limit your time, one is increase your distance and Three is shielding, you know, shield yourself from that patient. So right now, the biggest thing we, we've done with COVID is we've increased our shielding with the expanded PPE uh, gowns in a lot of cases, um, specifically. But when you talk about the time and distance with this monitor being able to do all those, uh, gather all that data for you quickly and with one person setting it up, now you, you've been able to reduce your time with the patient because something that maybe took 30 minutes now you can do it in 15 or 20 or maybe even 10. Um, and then with distance we have less people around the patient. This monitor also has the capability of transmitting these vital signs in real time to the hospital. So now if you contact the hospital and say we have a suspected COVID patient, here's their numbers, they're going to see those as those numbers are being, uh, as that num data is being gathered. The second piece of, of equipment is something that currently no EMS agencies in Spokane County, with the exception of Life Flight, use, and that's a, uh, a portable ventilator. Now, ventilators were big in the news with COVID because there was a fear of a shortage. Um, this portable gen generator um, helps in reducing one of the other key things in the regional EMS paperwork and also from the American Heart Association with COVID-19 guidelines is to reduce the amount of aerosol generating procedures such as nebulizers, CPAP, etc. In fact, it says CPAP here uh, should be totally discontinued. 
Now CPAP can be a life-saving measure for a, a COPD patient or a patient with, with some other respiratory condition. But with the CPAP, you get a lot of aerosol created. Uh, this portable ventilator allows you to have a 100% closed circuit. So the exhaled air goes back into the device and so it's, it's in a, a closed loop, so you have no aerosol. You can also use the, still use the CPAP on this ventilator or even a BiPAP. And I, I'm not sure if you know the difference between those two devices. A CPAP is continuous pressure. You put a mask on the patient's face and it, it's continuous pressure blowing into them. Think of it like if you took your vacuum and made it a blower and put that in your mouth. That's kind of what the CPAP does. It just continuously blows. A BiPAP is one that provides pressure when you inhale and then relaxes so you can exhale easier. Uh, this device would allow us, we have currently have CPAP on our uh, fire apparatus. But we don't have a BiPAP capability or the ventilator cap capability. So once we intubate or even use CPAP on that patient, we, we now have, can get that, you know, 100% closed circuit to reduce aerosol. The third piece of equipment is a mechanical CPR device and it's called the Autopulse. There's two big brands out there. There's the Autopulse by Zoll and the Lucas device by PhysioControl. And I've had the uh, luxury of being able to train with both of these. They're both very good products. Uh, the auto pulse, once applied, you don't have to have anybody doing CPR. The device does it for you. The auto pulse is a band that goes across the patient's chest and not only provides the downward compression like CPR, but it compresses the whole chest cavity from all angles. Uh, and it's actually, you can wear this, you can put this device on in, in training. I actually, they put it on me and, and it, it's not, going to harm your harm you with the way it compresses. Uh, currently, like I said, 10 or 12 people in a cardiac arrest setting, probably three of those people would be doing CPR. So this device you can get put on a patient in, if you train on it, and I went to a training and in about two or three evolutions, we were all putting this device on, on people in 30 seconds. So 30 seconds into the, having that piece of equipment on scene, You've now taken three people and taken them completely out of harm's way. That combined with the ventilator, you're now taking somebody else that's having to manually bag that patient and you've taken them and, and taken them out of the way. So all this equipment together um, should do those four things that I, that I spoke about. It should expand the ability to respond, improve, improve our provider safety, decreasing exposures, and hopefully improving patient outcomes. So if you have questions for me, I'm happy to answer them the best I can. So commissioners, I think the total last two, I don't know if they've indicated it, for, for the new system, what was submitted is about 1684688 and two cents. So that is the cost for all of, Dave, all of what you sent me, I believe from, for all the pieces of equipment. Uh, that's correct. There was, yes, that's those three devices plus uh, AEDs, which would be compatible with this equipment. So if an AED was on scene first, then all you have to do is simply unplug the cable from the AED and plug it into your your advanced monitor and you keep on you just keep on moving along so that's why the AEDs are in there we provide an AED in every staff vehicle we have so that's why there's a number of AEDs on there um, so yeah this that what I've spoke of is everything that's included is there a written presentation on this? I don't have anything. I, I sent it. I don't know if you have, you guys have gotten it or not. Did, I think you sent this out. This was from Zoll. Oh, Josh and Mary, did you get a copy of the, the written presentation? I, so, I don't. Us, no, yeah, I, I don't have any it. of this information. So we're, we're kind of flying a little blind here in terms of exactly 
what the what the nature of the the, the equipment the request is. Um, so you have a copy of it. He, yes, so I yeah I sent it. And Gina yeah. has got a copy. Yeah, if you could send that to us again, assuming that we got it the first time, and let us uh, let us take a look at this. Um, It really provides for us at Spokane Valley Fire and hopefully to become a you know front runner in the county to with the ventilator we'd be the only agency that would have those and then of course our patients would stay on that ventilator as they went with AMR and one of our providers to the hospital but I feel like that's one of those pieces of equipment that one of us needs to take the first step and where it does so much in terms of reducing aerosol and I don't see COVID going away anytime soon. And so that, and then plus the, our current monitor, our cardiac monitor was brand new. They were brand new in 2009 and we're still using them. We've had to add external modems to them to be able to get some of the capabilities that we have now or that this device would provide. Now think about using a, a 10 year old or 11 year old cell phone or tablet or laptop or something and that's really kind of where we're at so <laughs> excuse me so part of the uh with covid restrictions in our own agency trying to you know uh be a little more conservative we were planning on adding um some of this equipment and you know piecemealing it together a couple pieces year at a time but now we're with it being a, a this large of an expense, we just were not comfortable in doing that at this time as an agency. Okay, uh, Mary, do you have a comment? Yeah, so so I guess one of one of my concerns, um, question, or I shouldn't say a concern, just a question is, if we do this for Valley Fire, we're we gonna do it for other, other agencies. And so that's something we need to look at um, as to, to what the other agencies' needs are. Um, I think when I did my, right along with fire aid i mean they had pretty up-to-date equipment and i know just in some funds that we just gave to fire 10 they got a new through the uh, tribes mitigation fund you know got like a a new piece of equipment that they were wanting for for hurt stuff so um so anyway, so i i would just want to make sure that you know if this is something you know doing for valley fire that we look at what what the other needs because otherwise we're going to have major what David, I'm sure you know, as soon as people hear that, that we did it for you, then it's like everyone else is coming. So I, I'd rather try to get what, what a total ask would be. Um, well, and, and the interesting piece, the unique piece about this is the entire Spokane County, with the exception again of LifeLight, uses a physio control product for their cardiac monitor, which is, this is a Zoll product. And physio control has not updated their equipment. Well, they've had, had small updates, but it's really, it's that same monitor from 2009. It, it might be a brand new uh, device, but it still has old technology. And they're going through some, some hoops with FDA and different people to get all their equipment um, okayed, I guess. Uh, I do believe Fire District 10, I do a lot of teaching out in the county with CPR. I do believe Fire District 10 is one of the agencies that just purchased, and I could be wrong, it could be Fire District 3, one of the West Plains departments, just purchased the uh, Lucas device, which is the other mechanical CPR device I mentioned briefly. It's, it's probably the main competitor to Zoll. It's the Coke versus Pepsi of the two. They're both very good products. I've used both of them. Um, Lucas is a little different. It's a piston that goes on your chest and it, that's how the CPR is done. It's a little bit bigger device. So like transporting into a helicopter is not very possible doing that, but that's, that's a real minor or, you know, not very, we don't like to transport people in cardiac arrest. We usually uh, will work the cardiac arrest in their house. And then once we restore pulses, we'll trans transport people. But we would still leave that mechanical device on the patient. So if they did go back into cardiac arrest, all you have to do is start it back up. But as for your question, I think your question is, if you provide this for us, what stops the rest of the county? Or why wouldn't the rest of the county want that equipment as well? And that's a really good question. I would think the rest of the county would want this equipment once they saw how that we had it and it works as well as it does. Uh, most of the people 
the fire service, like a lot of industries, don't like to change a whole lot. And this would be a big change from going from physio control to Zoll, but the Zoll, but this equipment is, it's really good stuff. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Josh, you have any comments or? No, I think, you know, Mary, Mary certainly, um, you know, cert certainly raised, you know, something that was going through my mind is, you know, if, if, if one, one department gets it, you know, or, you know, is, is everyone else going to come and, and ask for one as well? And you know, I mean, what 1.6 is, is a lot of money if, if we're purchasing one for every single department in the, in the county. So, um, you know, and, and again, like, like I said, I, I didn't receive any of the, any of the information on this prior to the presentation. I see, I see Gina has now uh, sent an attachment to us a couple minutes ago. So, um, oh, this is a 39 page document. So I, I would like uh, to, to kind of look through this and see exactly what, uh, what, what the document has in it uh, before taking a vote. Yeah, so uh, uh, I, I agree, uh, Josh and, and, and Mary, with your comments as well. But uh, I'd like to be able to, to take a week and be able to review the document and, and then come back and have a conversation about it maybe next Monday, uh, if, that, uh, if that's agreeable with, with the two of you. Anybody object to that? No. Okay. Monday or Tuesday. I mean, I don't care which day, but I just like to have time to go through the document and get better familiar with it as well as understanding the unintended consequences of it. Okay. Are you okay with that, Mary? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Dave. Appreciate the update. And, uh, uh, we'll probably tee this up for uh, discussion and some kind of action on Monday. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks, Dave. Okay. That gets us to Mr. David Guthrie. Uh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, commissioners and uh, guests. So I'm David Guthrie, Executive Director of the Northeast Public Development Authority, um, which we all familiar, but the Northeast Public Development Authority is focused on economic development, uh, redevelopment, revitalization, enhancing economic opportunities in Northeast Spokane. In that capacity, I reached out to the Innovation Collective, which is headquartered in Coeur d'Alene about workforce training opportunities in the short term and in the longer term. And in the short term, uh, there is what we believe is an exciting opportunity uh, to provide workforce training to COVID impacted populations, specifically in the area of IT tech support. The uh, Innovation Collective, uh, they describe themselves as an education and human capital company. They're about eight years old, operations of different sorts in approximately 20 locations uh, worldwide. They have partnered with Apple, Google, the United States Air Force, uh, Governor, the Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development, Idaho National Laboratories, University of Idaho, Arizona State, and others. Uh, the basic uh, program in this case is 90 days. The Innovation Collective has partnered with Google. Uh, they're proposing to utilize a program called Grow with Google. Uh, the program consists of both soft skills training and technical training. The, we're budgeting for approximately 100 learners. The, at the end of the coursework, the learners receive what's an IT uh, support professional certificate from Google. They also receive credit recommendation by the American Council on Education or ACE, which is the industry standard for translating workplace learning uh, to college credit. Essentially, it's uh, equal to 12 college credits and, or four associate level classes. The certificate program is for uh, beginners, no prior experience required. And the certificate prepares the learners for an entry level uh, position as an information technology sport, sports specialist. 
Skills learned include uh, customer service, troubleshooting, network protocols, cloud computing, Windows operating system, Linux command line systems, admin, and more. Uh, to summarize potential, the, the, the individuals that go through the program uh, will receive the equivalent of, of potential college credits. Uh, they'll receive the ACE certification. Uh, they will have the, um, the, uh, the education and the preparation for an entry level position in the IT level support jobs. And importantly, the Innovation Collective coordinates the information from the learners, their resumes, uh, ACE certification, and syndicates or sends that out to 50 companies who are uh, hire, interested in hiring these particular types of graduates. Uh, based on their prior work in data, approximately 80% of the IT support learners report career, positive career impacts within six months, such as getting a raise or finding new jobs. And statistically, the median salary of IT support jobs nationwide is almost $55,000. So while an applicant wouldn't necessarily get a $55,000 job, it would put them on a pathway to achieving that level of income. So the uh, request in this case is uh, grant funding or CARES Act uh, funding for approximately $228,000. Uh, that includes uh, devices for a device library, uh, the different types of technical support, uh, marketing support, uh, and program launch, which I'll, uh, Innovation Collective is on the phone. We've got uh, the CEO, Nick Smoot, and the uh, director of, um, business development, um, Garen Moreno on the call as well. Uh, payments uh, would be made monthly as services are performed, uh, financial management, uh, and I envision the NEPDA providing the, man the financial management and oversight in conjunction with our uh, public accounting firm, Anastasi Moore and Martin. And uh, obviously key performance indicators, measurements, uh, audit requirements, expense tracking, other terms and conditions would have to be uh, mutually agreed upon. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, from my perspective, a quick summary, and I'll turn the uh, presentation over to Innovation Collective, and I see Nick on the call there. Hi, nice to see you guys. Uh, Garen's here with me as well. Hello. Um, and this is a part of our rapid learning programs that we provide with our technical partners. Um, I think David did a fantastic job explaining it. Um, a few things I think that might be important for call out, um, one of which is the landing library of the laptops will continue to stay in the county and be housed with one of the education institutions to be a platform that there can be ongoing training with. Um, and um, I think that that's kind of the main thing. I think that's a very important to call out. Uh, and we'd love to be receiving any questions that people may have. Unless, Garen, is there anything specific you think we should add in there? No, unless you want to touch briefly on what this is in terms of the big picture. With uh, Sure, sure. Um, this is a, uh, that's a great point. I'll be very brief. Um, this is a part of a, a larger national effort where we are starting to work with some federal um, senators and congressmen across the country to rethink how local rapid workforce and entrepreneurial training can be delivered at the county by county level. Um, so uh, there is eyes on this, um, watching this program as a proof of concept. And um, really it comes down to uh, what we all know is there's been a significant disruption in education and in the workforce through this period of time uh, with COVID. Um, and uh, this is a part of a, a larger plan um, to try and re redesign how industry can train people quickly. Okay, any uh, questions, either Mary or Josh? Mary? Um, yeah, so, so I guess uh, on the PDA side, I mean, I. You know, I'm not on. I'm on a different one than than this one, so it's you know a little more unique um, with the university district. But 
I mean, are we really doing the workforce development or are we partnering with agencies and organizations to work on that workforce development? I thought we were trying to provide the opportunity for, to help get the companies, you know, the economic, you know, indicators that way. So, so I mean, I'm just kind of, you know, reeling in from seeing if this is really what we should be doing as, as PDAs and, and, and should we be partnering with agencies and, um, I guess in particular on this one, I would like to have you know, some input from our IT department as to uh, their thoughts on this as, as we would be, you know, hopefully somebody who would be hiring some, someone from this type of group. So, um, so I can just say I'm not ready to make a decision today, um, but I, I definitely would want to get Becky Garrett's you know, take on this and, and kind of understand, you know, the role of PDAs to make sure that I'm clear that this is what we should be doing as part of the PDAs. Is that a, that's not a question, right? <laughs> no, that's a statement. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I thought, okay, sorry. Thank you. No, that's all right. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to respond to that too, uh, to, to some extent. So, uh, Mary, we, um, yeah, I originally reached out to the Innovation Collective um, on a longer term program. And uh, that program is, um, kind of the core of the business model of the Innovation Collective, which is called a, it's a 36 month program ecosystem activation plan, which really helps promote uh, small business growth, startups, creating a culture of innovation, uh, which leads to significant increase in, you know, incubation accelerator and, and just formation growth and support for small business. And in the Northeast, you're gonna see a lot of small businesses the real estate, we've got about 700 parcels up there of less than a half acre. It's conducive to, to small business. And so I initially reached out to uh, the Innovation Collective to help uh, provide that support to change the ecosystem, to help small businesses flourish. You know, wealthy areas tend to have lots of capital, access to mentors. They've got different kinds of programs that are available. Uh, disadvantaged areas tend not to have those same things. Innovation Collective can provide those resources and that support it doesn't exist up there presently. So that's what, uh, why I reached out to them initially, but then we started talking more about short-term opportunities. And how do we uh, utilize, uh, how, do, how do we help people in the short-term that have been adversely impacted by COVID-19? And so that's how we transition to kind of the immediate request. And while a PDA isn't uh, necessarily the optimal lead, um, I can, I'm just providing the background of how we, how we got here uh, today, because we do have a bigger vision that goes down the road well past uh, the end of 2020, where we'll, where we'll be partnering with, uh, or we anticipate partnering with Innovation Collective to help support uh, small business growth in Northeast Spokane. Okay. Josh? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't, I don't have any questions. I, I understand the, the program. Yeah. And so, with, oh, go ahead. I was going to say with the comment too, that Mary made about having the county hire some of the IT folks or that being a goal, we love that. And that's a, actually a big initiative is not only getting the municipalities able to hire in if they're doing consulting out or hiring consultants, we usually can bring it in at a lower price. Some of our other partners like Catalyte um, do that consistently in Baltimore and other locations. Um, so that's super important to us. And on the Google IT program, if your IT person wants to talk with us or um, Lisa at Grow With Google, who's the lead there running google.org, super happy to connect those dots and explain uh, the level of efficiency that they, they take in this program. So uh, I guess I'll weigh in here. Uh, a couple different things, and uh, one, I'm, I'm not sure I fully appreciate the linkage to COVID. Um, this is an educational opportunity that would exist regardless of whether COVID uh, was there or not. Uh, and so uh, and because it's an educational grant program, I am challenged by, uh, one, how do you advertise the availability of it? How do you choose who can participate? What's the selection process that's going to get people into the program? 
Um, you, I mean, and, and uh, then when you're done with the program, you have a certificate, Yahoo. Uh, what, how is that the pathway to a job? Uh, does the, is the, uh, the employer out there uh, looking for people with this certificate or not? And if they're not, then what's the marketability of it? Uh, yeah. Compare this to, uh, you know, people in the aerospace industry can go to the community college and get uh, uh, E9000 certificate that is basically a paper that is like gold in terms of getting manufacturing mm -hmm. jobs with aerospace manufacturing companies. You know, does this have that same cat? Um, cachet to it or not I don't know sure. uh, and I do uh, would like to get input from Becky Garrett and our IT people I agree with Mary uh, I, I don't know what the what the marketability is of this and so I, I need people that are smarter in that industry than me to be able to help advise yeah. and stuff. so I think from my standpoint I've still got some some work to do to get there and still challenged by, and I think this is one of the things that Mary was trying to get to, still challenged by, is this the kind of work product that we want a PDA invested in when you've got community colleges and other technical training schools that are already doing that? Why would the PDA replicate what's already being done by other industries or other sectors? So I'm still, still trying to noodle myself around how do sure. we get there? Uh, so those are just some of my observations or questions. I may, I, may I quickly answer a couple of those? Sure. Um, on the COVID related scenario, we are delivering this program in another county um, directly to, it, ha it, is, it has to be for COVID individuals. And so it's people who've either lost their jobs, had reduced hours or reduced income. And there's an application intake form that the folks have to go through. Uh, so that's in part who we're trying to serve. And um, the, the other piece on the relevancy of the program, they do have the 80% success rate at either increase in salary or finding a job. We, this program does work with individuals who go from no training and rapidly move them up the chain into the ability within three-ish months to be a Google IT certified professional. Google has removed um, any requirement for four-year university, and they do accept these certificates as a form of people they hire for remote work, as do 50 of those folks that they syndicate the job role through. So it's, um, I can't speak directly to the aerospace one, because much like how you feel kind of in the blind on this, I feel a little bit in that way in the aerospace side. Um, but the other piece I would say as well is the community college and the universities that are working on these programs, um, we work alongside of uh, the, the universities and the community colleges across the country. And our target audience is often someone that they're not um, maybe engaging because of volume that they already have and that they have to engage with or that they have in their community. And um, we are working in tandem with the APLU, which is the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. Uh, Mohawk Valley Community College, Pasco, um, Hernando State College, and helping serve an audience that they don't draw in and delivering a product that's a bit out of the box, but gets people on the pathway to lifelong learning and moves them into this. Um, so ha happy to go deeper on these and do our best to answer it um, to what we can and what might add value. And other than that, um, I think that's all. So why, why through the PDA and not through workforce development? I, David's a nice man and we're talking. I mean, that's where we're at right now. Um, All right. I think the goal is to serve people up in that region efficiently. And our history of working with communities across the country and starting to build unlikely coalitions of people and building their confidence back and helping them climb through entrepreneurship and new workforce skills is the goal, the placemaking work and the kind of economic resiliency that happens and the adaptive reuse of properties, I think is part of what we've been talking through with that region. Um, so how we get there, I'm unsure, but we're all at the table right now. I think David might be able to answer some of that too. 
Yeah, I would just say that uh, all PDAs are not created equal. And uh, so when you're talking about the Northeast, you have to recognize this is a severely disadvantaged population. You've got one of the poorest areas in the state. You've got the highest concentration of unpaved roads in the city. You've got a myriad of environmental challenges. And so you, in, in general, your population, you have high crime, high poverty, high levels of food insecurity, low levels of educational attainment, and it would be my position that the traditional workforce programs in the community have not been effective in reaching those particular populations. Now, I'm not saying that the NEPDA is perhaps the right entity. You know, I believe that we, we uh, can be for this short-term program. Long-term, I believe we absolutely are an important piece to this solving this ecosystem challenge in the Northeast. But to create a culture, an ecosystem that is conducive to small business development, growth, uh, it's going to take uh, some unique thinking. And so far, I haven't seen that in our community as it applies to Northeast Spokane. Okay. So, uh, like the, uh, uh, the other topic, uh, I'm thinking maybe we take a week and review the package and maybe get some of our questions answered. Uh, then uh, next week we can have uh, Becky Garrett come in and kind of uh, uh, give her perspective on this as well. What do you think? Anybody object to that? Either Mary or Josh? Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's tee this up for next Monday. And then uh, uh, when we put it on the agenda, let's make sure we get Becky here to help us uh, deal with the, uh, the IT side of the equation. Great. All right. If there's anything ahead of time with Becky or others, just know Garen and I are available or others on our team to meet with them. Of course. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you very All much. Right. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you. Thank All you right. So Appreciate it. I'm that gonna, gets us to you, Carrie. I, I am going to talk really, really, really fast today because really there's people, people behind you that want to sit in your time. Um, commissioners, I had a uh, request today, just on a personal note, we made our first, like I think last week we hit a milestone of about 25 contracts that we've contracted out to uh, outside entities and terrorist dollars. And one of the things that's required is that I get monitoring done on all of these entities. So I happen to have a conversation with Cindy Wendell who let me know that she is leaving GSI on October 16th. And so I thought, well, so she's already got a lot of experience in this area with half of the contracts we've already entered. And she's done some PPE buying for you. And we kind of think that that's going to also be required the last 30 days to really draw this down um, and probably into November, actually. Um, I wondered if she'd be available. And she indicated she was. And I would like permission it, from you if we could enter a professional service contract that I would put her um, under contract. I, I believe like part time for October 5th until October 19th, and then she would be uh, on full time starting the, the 19th of October. I asked her to take a look at what her salary you know, or what her hourly rate would be. We've come up with a, a rate of about $80 an hour, which covers her paying her taxes, covering her medical and, and dental, which I find to be reasonable for what I'm going to be asking her to do including her mileage, because she'll be probably doing a lot of off-site monitoring for me. So all total, it will probably be somewhere around 41, 42,000 in CARES funding between October 5th and, and December 30th. Uh, and it would keep me from going insane. Let's just put it that way. Which means my life would be a lot more that safe would be and correct secure, wouldn't it? Adult, Mr. Dillon. So I'm, I'm asking um, if we can enter a professional service contract, I'd be putting together a contract for your review if I receive permission from you and trying to put that on the agenda for next Tuesday. So would, uh, would this be a position that would be eligible for CARES funding? Correct. 
So it'd be CARES funding, not general funding. That no, not general, general funding. Fund. It would totally be CARES dollars. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, thoughts, either Mary or Josh? I'm I'm okay with it. Uh, I'm I'm comfortable with it. I think um, you know, like Harry said, there's a great deal of amount of work that needs to happen between now and, and the end of the year. And I think Cindy has experience with it with the work she's been doing at, at GSI. So I mean, there, there there's not a ton of people that have experience dealing with these uh, with, with the CARES dollars and monitoring the way they're spent. So I mean, it's a, it's a limited pool out there, and I assume Cindy. Cindy gained that knowledge when she's been with GSI. Correct. Okay. Mary. Um, yeah, I'm I'm comfortable with that. So, um, you know, I, I will say Cindy and I are also friends, so I, I kind of feel like I want to stay out of you know some of the decision part of it. Okay, I'm in favor of it. So uh, go ahead and put together a package and Thank you. and uh, let's see it up for next week. And Jerry thanks you as well. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. <laughs> we were going to do it for you, but we're going to do it for you. Exactly, him. Commissioner. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting out of here before the eject button. Goes. My life a lot easier <laughs> right there. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioners. You bet. Thank you. All right. Mr. Doug Chase and Party. Table for four. Come drive in. Good morning. Doug. Hi. Paul. Oh, we have uh, one item that we're excited to report on that uh, we're looking to bring to probably next week's consent agenda, if that goes well. And then we have um, just a brief presentation that we threw together after that, just to provide some uh, very brief updates on a handful of our uh, projects that we have going on. So probably... I think we're hoping that um, yeah. all the, were you looking to have maybe a map or the one sheet? Or no, I think I can go with that. Okay. It's just fine. This is pretty quick and simple. Okay. So this is in regards to uh, the extension of our uh, Micah Peak Limited Hunt Pilot Project that we briefed you on last, uh, I think last fall, um, after going through a public process on it. and. Um, this is being done in coordination with uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife to control and reduce high populations of white-tailed deer and turkey up around Micah Peak. And um, basically we work through their hunt by reservation program, which allows hunters to sign up for slots or days to go up there. Um, it's a maximum of, of one hunter or a group of hunters per day. Um, basically Monday through Thursday, which are our slowest recreational days out there. Uh, and basically from October, around October 11th to December 31st annually. And that's also coinciding with our, our slowest time of year for recreation up at Mike Peak and our other properties. So um, last year, we, we had our first pilot project season. Um, Fish and Wildlife deemed that very successful. We had 26 hunters participate. We don't know what they were able to pull off the property, but um, just having hunters up there moving the populations along and around um, is, is successful in and of itself uh, to keep them from overgrazing and, and congregating and spreading disease amongst uh, other turkeys and, and uh, white-tailed deer. So, um, Anyways, what, what we're coming to you today with is a basically a three-year extension of that project. So it's a contract with Fish and Wildlife to continue to have this hunting opportunity at the Mike Peak Conservation Area uh, around the same uh, months of the year and the same days, again, targeting white-tailed deer and wild turkey. So um, at least from our perspective, too, we heard nothing but positive comments from the public on it. Uh, we have a lot of signage up there that we installed last fall to inform people of, of the hunt that will be going on and overall seemed to go very smoothly. So uh, if the board is supportive, this, would, this contract and ex three year extension would be on your consent agenda for next Tuesday. Okay. Uh, thoughts, either Mary or Josh? Um, so you guys did this, you said last year? Was that the first year you did it? Yes. Yep. 
And so you put up signage and all that. I'm assuming. <laughs> just, just double checking. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And, the, and do they have to get like a permit though to to shoot to to hunt? So they already people that sign up to hunt up on Mike Peak, Mike Peak. They already have to have the applicable license in order to sign up through the program. So it's a very controlled way of having hunters go up to the property. We have basically Fish and Wildlife has their names. They know that they have a license or, or applicable tag. And, um, and if we need names or there's some sort of issue, we can contact Fish and Wildlife and figure out who was up there on which days. Yeah, so. it, it's by reservation only. And Fish okay. and Wildlife coordinates all of that side. And of course, it ties to the habitat management of the property, which they felt was a very positive outcome. And, um, and so as a result, we're, we're pleased to share the results and recommend that the program continue. And I think it's for a three-year period. We will continue to evaluate it annually. And then um, I think for the resolution, there's the ability for me to continue it beyond that. Uh, again, as we evaluate it annually, if it continues to be positive for the community and for the property, and then uh, we we have a, a great fit for this site. Great, thank you. Thank you. Josh, your thoughts? Yep. No, I'm I'm comfortable with it. But well, I'll just I, I'm very appreciative. I'm glad that this includes the signs. Uh, because I think it's important that the turkeys and the deer know where they can cross <laughs> safely. And so, so that's a big plus. <laughs> so yeah, go ahead and tee it up. <laughs> we definitely get some big turkeys out there at times, that's for sure. Oh, Thank you. And I welcome. wish they would read the song. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Okay. That's uh, it. Uh, I think we're ready for the quick PowerPoint here, just to okay. provide, uh, again, uh, this is just informational, where I want to start catching up. Now that we're starting to wind our season down, it's a chance for me to try to get in here and update you on all the great stuff we haven't had time to tell you about, but it's been going on. So I uh, thought we'd start with a few projects today, and Chris Crone, our landscape architect, is... Uh, Put something together here. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us this morning. Just a quick five minute uh, overview on what we've been up to uh, lately here. So, starting up at Bidwell Park, we're about 85% complete with that project. Nice. That's um, nice. So, this photo was taken late August, and uh, just as a reminder for the overall project budget, is about 7.9 million, which includes about 6.1 million in REIT dollars and 1.7 million in federal, state, and local grants, and then about 60,000 from the developer agreement and uh, remaining donations from the original property owner. So here's another photo of Bidwell looking south over the park. Uh, the ball fields here are on the left and in the center, and then the sand volleyball courts, and pickleball courts, and aquatic facilities on the right side of the photo. Back into the ranch in that picture. You can, yeah. So here's a little bit closer view of the West Side Playground and pickleball courts, and also the sand volleyball courts. You know, Doug wanted to mention. Yeah, I, and here I just wanted to use this slide as an opportunity, uh, just to plug you in. We've we've had a uh, just a crazy amount of growth in pickleball out in our park system this year. I think it's it's one of those activities that um, is very. Uh, I guess COVID compatible with the small group numbers. And uh, we've seen growth and use of the courts like we've never seen before. And more recently, we've, we've had uh, folks reach out to us uh, with an interest in seeing uh, the brush concrete court surface taken up to a higher, more competitive level type surfacing uh, we have a lot of uh, pressure and interest um, in seeing some upgrades to our existing Camelot, no, excuse me, not Camelot, but, um, oh gosh, Linwood and 
Holmberg. I don't know why I'm confusing Holmberg with Camelot, but um, these are two probably 30, 40, 50 year old facilities that are in need of some upgrading. Uh, Chris has been doing a lot of research into these surfaces. They typically last five to eight years. We're looking at trends and uh, again, just wanted to let you know that this is something we'll come back and visit with you on um, as we're receiving um, enthusiasm and, and energy and, and pressure uh, like we've never seen before. So we are looking into it. We like to be responsive, but also very mindful of what, what will last going forward in the future and what we'll be able to maintain. Um, and <laughs> just to give you an idea, uh, the, the city of Spokane uh, has some uh, organized tennis recreation programming that they've done. And it's not just within our facilities, but uh, folks are able to bring portable equipment and set up on a tennis court and play pickleball court. Uh, and play pickleball, this has happened so significantly that there was a recent incident in the city of Spokane Park where the police had to be called in to, in order to convince the mostly um, older population that was playing pickleball that um, the courts were reserved uh, for city programming of the tennis. And um, it's, it's just, it's, that's, again, this is just, we're seeing stuff out in our park system that we haven't seen before. We have any, I mean, we're glad golf, you know, golf new is up, pickleball is up. There's a handful of these things. So we're, we're trying to uh, be as proactive as we can and we'll be looking into um, some type of process and potential um, requests going forward and how we might improve some of these dilapidated facilities. But we, we also wanna be mindful there are some folks that like tennis too and as we look at this. So anyhow, uh, chance to bring you in the loop on that in case you happen to get an email or two. Jerry, just out of curiosity, what give, give me a wag on what it costs to put a golf ball court up. Um, you know, I think it depends on the on the surface material and, and that, that top coating that, that I was talking about, but you know, hundred to hundred and fifty thousand bucks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sounds like the city's in a pickle. <laughs> so um so I have a comment on that. So Doug, I would have you reach out to Phil Champlin at the Hub Sports Center. Because pre-COVID, I mean, it was a huge league that they had during the day for elder mm -hmm. that were retired. Um, and so, so seeing all those people that couldn't go, can't go indoors now that are coming outdoors. And, and so he could probably give you a pretty good read on, you know, what the size of it is and, and, and that. And, and we're definitely seeing it. I see it, you know, down at Edgecliff Park, you know, that they've converted, you know, several mornings. It's difficult. Um, I don't think it has to be that expensive to do, you know, I mean, we're not trying to do competition courts. I mean, we just had to restripe our sport court and, you know, it, it's not a hundred thousand dollars. It's just an asphalt sport court that we stripe for pickleball as well. So, I mean, have it for a basketball hoop and then, then, a, you know, for a pickleball court, just since it wasn't big enough for tennis. So, um, so I think we just got to be realistic as to what we really, what we can really provide, you know, is, you know, I guess Absolutely. what that is, but, but it's pretty easy, you know, to get, you know, and I think a lot of them are bringing their own stuff to, you know, their cones and all that to kind of put the size of the court on for, for, for pickleball. But I think if you talk to Phil at the hub, um, he'd give you some pretty good insight. Okay. Yeah. We, we've been doing a lot of, uh, outreach here lately and we're we're learning a lot it's it's uh it, again it's a, a very much a growing sport and uh, we'll continue to do that we'll reach out to phil as well thank you that's helpful to know that he's been working with that league and um it's just it's been pretty amazing to, to have that interest and appreciate just being able to bring you all in the loop there as we we continue to work on this well and it's it's really growing i mean we've seen people who yes. you know, able to do tennis as much and so it's a smaller court so it's just much more flexible and easy for um, people as they start to age so we say yes and it's it's been very interesting the the first couple of years at our prairie view south side park again the court's been under huge use and folks have been really happy with it and 
and now we're finding that you know it's becoming very specialized and a lot of demand for special court treatment and so we're we're really trying to take the time to to learn to see what may or may not be a good fit for the county courts and accommodating the demand for sure so okay thank you for that and i'll let chris wrap up and i'll just add just quickly uh that those that cost was really from the ground up that's what I, and that's what yes. i meant yeah and with, just, with the fencing and, and right. there's a lot of um potential other stuff and the city of spokane has provided some of their costs to us um, just to rebuild some of their courts as well mm -hmm. and that that kind of is, is fairly typical of what they've been spending to totally redo or build from scratch uh, yeah and that could be four pickleball courts for example at, at a hundred thousand okay here's a uh, uh, slide of showing the nature playground, the basketball court, and one of the new picnic shelters. Um, trees and plants are currently being installed, and the park is planned to be seeded within the next few weeks here. Um, after some touch-up seeding in the spring, we're hopeful that the field will be ready for use in the late spring or early summer of, of 2021. So here's a short video showing the progression of the work up at the south side aquatic facility. The enhancement project that we're uh, trying to ramp up up there. Uh, so this project budget was about 940,000. The majority of those funds coming from REIT dollars. So here's another photo showing the, those new slides, um, as well as the cool deck expansion here. And as of uh, Friday, Spokane Regional Health District has all the, the drawings they need to complete their final inspections. The health district has certainly had their hands full this year, but um, we've been working with them trying to trying to get this project wrapped up. So moving on to Liberty Lake Regional Park. So we're finalizing two RCO grant applications that would fund the phase one of the master plan implementation out there. If we're successful in receiving that funding, uh, this project would include replacement of the beach area restroom, a new beach access road, new and expanded dock, parking improvements, a new gate entry system, new picnic shelter by the water, and various ADA improvements. Uh, also, you might recall that uh, Paul was briefed the board last week on the uh, aquatic DNR lease, um, which covers the swim area and the dock. So the DNR owns the, the lake itself, basically, and we're leasing that property for the, the swimming area and the dock. So here's a rendering of, that's part of our grant application, kind of showing the renovated beach area. Uh, this proposed project budget is 1.9 million, which is made up of $450,000 local allocation, REIT dollars and 1.45 million in grant funding. So staying out at Liberty Lake Regional Park, uh, here's some of the latest renderings of the overall design theme that we're working towards to, to use in the future renovation of the park. Those are on the right side of the slide here. Those are concepts that are um, what we'll be working towards over time. And we're also working on the left side of the slide on a full service uh, accessible cabin design that, that would be built in the campground area. And this design uh, might also be used as a template for other cabin sites in the future. And lastly, we're also working on a Hauser trailhead construction project. It's about 60% complete. So this, this trailhead is located uh, east of Newman Lake. You can see the red star there with the yellow outline. It's right near the uh, the Idaho border. So the uh, Hauser Conservation Area would be accessed by this new trailhead. Here's the in-house rendering that we uh, worked on to provide dependable access to the 170-acre site. And then lastly, this is just a uh, 
a photo of the Houston Trailhead from last week. And so the budget for this project was about fifty thousand uh, dollars, material only, and that's coming from CFMNO. And the crew is pushing to have this site open by the end of the year. Actually, building this project in house with our park operations crew. So. That's the last of the updates. Okay. okay. Yep. And we just, again, picked a handful of projects that we'd tell you about, and there's probably uh, another eight or more similar out there, and we'll, we'll try to provide some updates here in the month or so ahead um, as we're finally at a point in the park season where we're, we're shifting gears to being a little more proactive and uh, wrapping up a very, very busy season. So we'll look forward to some statistics there in the month or so ahead too. Um, it's, it's been a record year in so many ways. So thank you for your time. Very good. Any questions for Doug and the crew before they leave? It's kind Very of funny good. with the, with the virus and all the issues that that's brought, it kind of helped the construction up at uh, it will. Kind of having not the folks not having it as occupied as it usually is kind of picked it up a little bit so. in that area yes yes what's the completion date um estimate for that i'll look to chris to see if we have one we don't have by the bit. spring of next year yeah it, it's uh they'll be pretty much done probably 95 percent done this fall okay. but the park's being seeded so that grass seed has to grow in and sure. it won't be complete really until the spring so that's kind of what we're choosing. I mean, good timing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, the uh, that gets us to uh, miscellaneous items. Thank uh, you, guys. Either Thank one you. of you have any miscellaneous items that you want to talk about? Mary, Josh. Nope. So. Yeah, I don't have any right now. So I need to uh, uh, revisit. Uh, uh, conversation we had last week with regard to the uh, 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 swap of the G, uh, UGA and the ORV park uh, so we can get that hearing scheduled and into the queue for uh, Peterson and the Planning Commission. Uh, so we were going to revisit that today. Any additional thoughts uh, with regard to moving forward with that, either positive or negative? It's too bad Doug just left because I was one of them was just you know making sure that he said it was it was so that he was I mean you, you said he was comfortable with it but since he was right there hopefully he can I think John just went out to go get him well just go get him uh, so John Peterson and Doug did have a conversation last week before last and Doug didn't have any issues but we can bring him back in Oh, yeah. Got Doug. All right. So the question is, Doug, uh, I, well, you come up here to the table. So I believe you had a conversation with John Peterson I did. with regard to uh, uh, taking the ORV park out of Dairy Heights out of the UGA boundary. Uh, and so uh, your thoughts. I think the, the initial thought we had is wanting to look into uh, if there'd be a, a significant increase in the water rates or if that could be something that we might negotiate with the city. Um, really being the only concern if we go from within city limits to outside city limits, as we know um, in some areas uh, that can cause an increase of 40% or more in the water rates. Uh, so I think that was just our first initial thought is uh, that, that might be something that could be looked at or discussed or negotiated and, and or simple as uh, something we would need to be aware of if that's a decision that's made. And uh, the agreement that we have out there with the, the nonprofit, um, we would want to just take a look and see what that equated to dollar wise. Uh, I honestly don't know with them covering all of those costs and I know they one component of the facility actually uses a well and water rights to um, for non potable to uh, handle dust control on the on the competitive track. It's more a dust control side. 
Uh, they do irrigate some shared areas. We invested in the purple water out in that area as well. So we would just want to quantify and see what that could equate to. And um, I couldn't tell you whether that's a thousand dollars, five hundred, or five thousand. But we'll we're trying to do a little digging into that. Um, but I think that was the only item we could really think of in looking at it. And and it obviously could have some great benefit for the county if that exchange were to take place. Okay, so if uh, if we were to move forward with that uh, and. Uh, you know, there's still a lot of work from the planning department and UGA so that those items can be addressed uh, at, uh, uh, during the process. So moving forward now, that's not a problem for you? No, not that I'm, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I think we're fine. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Yeah, I think I would just want to get those addressed because we just want to make sure we don't have, you know, seen with, as I said, in, inside the city versus outside the city and in the right. on the valley with uh, the irrigation district on, you know, Plant Ferry, just how, you know. Yes, yes, thank you. Change. Yeah, and that's, that's why we definitely would enjoy quantifying that and, and maybe being proactive there with the city, which it sounds like they would have some benefit too, of course, and maybe there's a win-win that can be reached. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Since the city's looking to do this, that's my guess is they're going to be pretty negotiable. I would hope so. Yeah. So yeah, that was kind of my. But we can start the process. We don't have. To, I mean, we got to go through the planning commission and everything else. So yep. there's time for you to address those issues before we get to a point where we actually do it. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yep. All we'll right. Any other? Thank you. Okay. So, um, so. To be able to give John the go ahead, we gotta we gotta tell him either it's either go or no go. So, um, what's, what's your guys' feelings on that? Okay I'm fine with forward? it. Okay, I, I'm I'm okay with him moving forward. Do we need to take action, or can we just give him a head nod? No, I think we can just give him a head nod that he's got to go ahead. And I don't believe we've got to take action on it. No, we do, we haven't taken an action on Paris's. Oh, no, no uh, so just a head nod. Tell him yep. to go ahead. He's got a he's got a schedule uh, hearing with the planning commission. He's got a two week notice and stuff. So planning commission meets here the first part of October, and then we've got a notice for the GMA steering committee. So I'm just concerned about making sure that we've given him enough time to do what he needs to do uh, for his notices and stuff. Okay. Right, because it's really up to the planning commission and then the steering committee. Yeah. Well, uh, so it has to go through both of them and then ultimately it comes back to us. So we're the final decision maker on it. But they, we got to go through them. So it probably won't come to us until November, uh, probably mid to end of November at the earliest. Uh, the steering committee is not meeting until the end of October. By the time they meet, do their uh, Voodoo on it and get it to us. Uh, it's going to take at least two to three weeks. So, all right, we will let him know. Move forward. And anything else for miscellaneous? So we don't have anything for this afternoon, and we don't have anything for tomorrow morning. So unless you guys want to get together just because you miss each other, uh, we will go ahead and cancel uh, this afternoon and tomorrow morning and not reconvene until two o'clock uh, tomorrow afternoon. And of course, we still have the eight o'clock tomorrow morning for those that really want to talk to uh, Health District. Okay. All right. That's it. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye.